can't even drive. I can't. Are you stupid, eh? Are you a stupid fool? Well, why can't you drive then? You can't even drive. So, uh, <laughs> I, I still think that new Chris Gard intro is an absolute banger, I have to say. It's, it's so uh, epic. I it's... feel like I'm coming out to the WWE. It goes hard, doesn't it? It goes hard. Yeah. I'm revved up. <laughs> I was a bit sleepy before that played, and now I'm ready to go. It's more, it is more fitting for Adam Curtis as well, somehow, isn't it? The, yeah, the, uh... he'd approve. Now, um, before we get going here, I will just mention Adam Curtis is still under the 7.8 thousand threshold, right? I.e., if this, if this episode gets less than 7.8 thousand views, Adam Curtis' season ends. And normal deepest law restarts. Okay, so uh, since I've set that rule, it's never hit under the seven point eight. But I'm just reminding people of that. Um, <clears throat> welcome, uh, Lee, you are actually the first guest on reviewing Adam Curtis. Nobody wanted to come on uh, Oceans <laughs> Apart, which is a shame because I thought Oceans Apart was absolutely brilliant. Uh, um, it, it's partly a shame, but also I I very much enjoy your solo streams. So you know, in a yeah. way, you you did a cracking job, <laughs> and I'm just here to to try to you know new season, new voice. Here I am. So um, yes, uh, if people don't know Luke, he is a, a, a regular on Unpopular Opinions, and um, I. A curious combination of tech bro and Christ bro. Do you think that's fair? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's. I think that's fair. I, I'm very much more proud of being a Christ bro than a tech bro. I feel like I'm trying to, I'm trying to <laughs> claw my way out of the kind of pit of tech um, to become a reformed man. D always refers to me as having kind of chaotic energy, so that maybe that that accounts for my multiple personalities. Um, but actually, the, my my most recent uh, reinvention is I'm start I'm starting an entirely new channel um, as part of Lamster this year, as well as doing my normal interviews. I'm setting up a a new channel for a big, high effort creative media piece, which is going to be an audio play. Um, in fact, I've got a trailer for it. Um, yeah, let me. Uh, would it be let possible me, to play that? Yeah, let's play the trailer for your new venture. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? Parsley, It's those dreams again, isn't it? Decisions you will soon make will change the fates of many. That intel from Athena had better pull through. We're taking a big risk on this one. You are already in deeper waters than you know. Tell me, what do you know of the Wiccan? The full truth about us would make your blood run cold. I can't stay long. Events are in motion that cannot be stopped. For each meatbag, I return to oblivion. A stroke of mechanical justice is writ upon this wretched universe. Their peace is subjugation. Their order is oppression. The world must be reborn through fire, and we will rise. Blood, Athena, is blood all you see. The deed is done. Remember this moment. In blood, the age of the Wiccan is born. I was digging for knowledge that should have stayed buried. The path before you dances on the edge between life and oblivion. Your body will change in the dark. What's happening to me? Who dares to enter the shadow realm of the Wiccan? 
Once it's out, it's out. Everything changes. Everything. The truth might shatter you, but living a lie is no life at all. You cannot always drift where the wind blows. Decisions you will soon make will change the fates of many. Be careful who you trust, Leo. In this world, everyone has a secret. Um, all right. Do you want to explain what that was? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this this is a high high production value audio play that I'm putting together. Um, I'm still working on it at the moment. It's going to feature all the stars that you know and love. I'm having Semiagog, Morgoth, D, Frodi, Philosopher Cat. They're, they're all taking part. Um, so as well as doing my interviews at the moment, I'm recording, I'm scoring, I'm doing everything. So th this thing is going to be absolutely epic. And it is on a new YouTube channel. So in, I think it's in the description here. Go and subscribe to it and hit the bell icon because I'm only going to probably upload one video to it and you don't want to miss it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that will probably be uh, the culmination of Lamster. So it will end up airing middle of April. Very interesting. Okay. Um, uh, oh, uh, the other thing I'll just mention, as I always do, by my courses at the Academic Agency, Trivium, Foundations of Economics, etc. Um, I am in. I'm going to work on a Shakespeare course soon, but I'm waiting to to be well, fit and well again to start on that. Um, now. Before we get going, Luke, you've you've prepared an Adam Curtis bingo card. <laughs> a bingo card, yes. As as you were saying, as the series go on, he becomes more and more Adam Curtis. So in a way, this is this is a yes. um, measuring stick of how Adam Curtis he has become. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a look. But then something strange happened. Yeah, yeah. The old system forms of power. Believed mm -hmm. it was possible to transform, to create a new and better. The story begins in burial plays. <laughs> yeah, we live in a strange <laughs> time. Was beyond their control. This is a story about, yeah, these are very Adam Curtis lines. During the Cold War, there's going to be a lot of that tonight, Luke. There's right. going to be a huge amount of <laughs> during the Cold War. <laughs> you, you only get one, one point for going through the Cold War, you know. Uh, nine Finger Inch rules. Nails plays, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think this is 92, maybe a bit early for Nine Inch Nails. Um, the collapse of yeah. the Soviet Union, psychiatrists, going to be some of them, I reckon. Manage the mm -hmm. system, plenty of that. The liberals gave up trying to change the world. Powerful mm. new vision idea, <laughs> yeah. There's something of our time. <laughs> but this was an illusion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the best one. <laughs> politicians but this was a fantasy the banks <laughs> the individual <laughs> but this was a myth <laughs> a simplified model of, yeah, absolutely um and um you, you know one of my favorite ones that you don't have on here is when uh -huh. um is when he just calmly says he kind of outlines the massive vision and the massive thing mm -hmm. and he just yeah. kind of deadpans but this plan failed <laughs> yes, they were convinced that they could control, but they were wrong. <laughs> but, but but this failed. <laughs> it always it always makes me laugh. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's make a start then. And like I said, um, just say pause when you want to say mm. something, and I'll, I'll yeah. pause it as quickly as I can. Okay. Sure. Three seconds. <laughs> Two seconds. One second. Last off. The age that we have just left, the 45 years since the end of the Second World War, was overshadowed by a strange partnership between science and fear. It began with a weapon created by scientists that threatened to destroy the world. 
But then a group of men who were convinced they could control the new danger began to gain influence in America. <laughs> but they were convinced. <laughs> Are we already uh, ticking out of criticisms on the... Yeah. Um... I feel like so I just to, to, see just to <laughs> place this documentary, right? 40, he said 15 years after the end of the Second World War. Um, so this is kind no, of the, the big... No? 92. So he said from 45... Oh, 45 years since. Yeah. Right, yes. So no, yes, 1945 you're... until 1992, I guess, is the period he has in mind. Yeah, is... Yes. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I think, yes, the end of the Second World War, but particularly the kind of 60s, 70s, 80s. We'll see, I Would manipulate terror. I, I, I'm pretty sure that this particular one, from memory, I, I haven't uh, rewatched it. Uh, I'm, I just because it's so short, I thought we could just watch it live. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm pretty sure this is JFK era, LBJ, okay. Nixon sort of time. Um, Got it. To do so, they would use the methods of science. Out of this would come a new age, free from the chaos and uncertainties that had led to terrible wars in the past. They believed. They believed. Honestly, at the beginning and fraudulently at the end. Now, I should mention that. I'll mention again, Pandora's Box, I think, is the last series that includes talking heads like this. So it's more Adam Courtesy than Oceans Apart was, but there are still these talking head elements which are basically completely eliminated by the time we get to Living Dead, which I think is 95. So uh, I quite like the confidence of having the, the voice of the documentarian with some authority is something cowardly about interviewing an expert and hiding behind i was just mm -hmm. reporting their opinion you know yeah i mean i should i should mind i mean i haven't really gone into this on this cv so far but i might as well go into a bit of um film documentary theory if there is such a thing um i i'm i am into a or i was into um a school called cinema verite right um or um, there, was, there was another variant of it as well. Um, this was in the 60s and 70s where they loved the fly on the wall style, right? Mm -hmm. Where it was literally no editorial voice, no narrator, and it was just, um, and there was no, or there were very few two camera talking head pieces. Um, and there are some fantastic films in this style. One of my favorite ones is called Salesman, 1969. There's another one called Titty Cut Follies. Um, Nick Broomfield has got a number of these um, where he looks at like kind of uh, buildings being demolished and things like that. And <clears throat> in kind of arty documentary making, um, this was seen as being cool and trendy. Mm. So uh, Adam Curtis, by having this authorial uh authorial narrative voice and his voiceover weaving together the archival things is a is a is a big departure from the cinema verite style if that makes any mm -hmm. sense so the cinema verite style was was made to seem like you were just watching a piece of like real life a slice of real life or something like this and you're just you know literally a fly on the wall or you're sitting and watching, observing people in their natural environment. Okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like Curtis, George, I feel like George, George Lucas made some cinema verite stuff in his early days. Yeah, I yeah, because it was very, it was very trend, Star it was Wars. very trendy around that time when George Lucas was uh, would have been coming up, you know, in the in the late sixties and the early seventies. Yeah. And um, I, I, I feel like Curtis's style, whether consciously or not, is kicking against that. He's he, in a way he's trying to find um, without trying to sound too wanky, Luke. He's trying to find an <laughs> idiom appropriate to our time, huh. i.e., realism. Well, fly on the wall realism is not appropriate for the world of fantasy that 
the liberals have created or something like this. Yeah. He, he's almost doing the opposite of Cinema Verite in that he's presenting you with footage that was shot for one purpose and then juxtaposing it with music and, and, and creating this tension between the two to so say, this is, this is the footage that I found, but here is me making you reconsider it, dig, dig beneath the surface. Yes, um, but if you, if you notice, a lot of the archival footage he uses is highly constructed or it was public information film or it's propaganda or it's advertising. So mm -hmm. in a way, Curtis is showing you the constructedness of the world in order to deconstruct right. it with his narrative. Yeah. Um, whereas the Cinema Verity guys were trying to show you the reality of the world. If that makes any sense. And in, in, a, yeah. in, a, in a strange way, there's a move from uh, a modernist form to a postmodernist form within the documentary. But, something like that's that. That's a beautiful contrast between the three. You, you have the original footage as it would have been aired with the peppy 50s underscore, some <laughs> orchestra making it sound exciting. The cinema verite would have been the original audio, uh, just dry, mm. like here's the experience of being on Wall Street. And then the Adam Curtis is what if we put some freaky music underneath it and yeah. make you, yeah. you know, make, co completely subvert the original creator? Uh, absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it does also often beg the question as to who is Adam Curtis making these films for and where mm. is he coming from? which is an ongoing question that we're asking on this series. <laughs> and how did it end up on the BBC, which is and, and why all, the BBC a propaganda continue? platform? <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's very unusual, but anyway, let's carry on. That they could create a better world and have control over this process of recreating the world through their science and their mathematics because it all sounded so damn rational and so damn reasonable as to be unassailable. Stout. Their opportunity came on October the 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union suddenly launched the first ever satellite, Sputnik. It was amazing to the American people that here was the spacecraft up in the sky, and suddenly the American people realized that the Soviet Union was not, as they were supposed to be, a backward power that was capable of providing us with caviar and, and ballet companies, but had no business being up in space. It was shocking to find out we'd been so wrong about them. It was shocking to discover that perhaps we had something to fear. Two months later, the Russians struck again. Sputnik 2 carried into space a dog called Laika. Change to Laika. As the Soviet Union flaunted its success, American politics... Can I just say something interesting that Curtis does as well um, in all of these documentaries, especially in this Pandora's Box series, though, is that our um, image of the Soviet Union, or certainly my image of the Soviet Union growing up, it was always the people queuing up in the supermarkets. They don't have enough potatoes. It's fucking cold. Gulags, Stalin, you know. Whereas he shows you stuff that could be from America, like the mirror. Mm. It's, it's like the mirror world of America, and I, I I find that really interesting. That you know the image that the Soviet Union projected to the world was actually. I mean, Edward Bernays is going to produce this. Do you know what I mean? It, it's mm. kind of. It's the exact same. It's um, you know the symbol of freedom, the cigarette, the sophistication. It's like an exact replica of America. I find that yeah. some would some would say your video the um, a different way of reading 1984 was carrying the Adam Curtis torch in that sense. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, very that, that you were taking taking footage of the Soviet Union, but making making it apparent that these people were living ordinary, fairly pleasant lives. For, for a yeah, I, absolutely. And, I, and I've, I've always been fascinated to look at the documentaries that the Soviets made themselves. One of my favorite movies, again, you see, I'm not, I am really sounding like a kind of art wanker on this, on this since, <laughs> since I've got someone to talk to now, but um, there's a, there's a film called man with a movie camera. 
1928, which is just a, it's got a mesmerizing visual style. And, you know, it's, it shows you Moscow in 1928. And it's, mm. you know, I don't think they faked it. I don't think they closed down all the streets to make it all look, I mean, I just think that's what life was like. Um, yeah. And and, and I, I do think that we have to, we have to remember sometimes that both in uh, the Soviet Union and indeed in Hitler's Germany, most people were just carrying on with their lives. Never, never and, saw a gulag or anything. Uh, wasn't it Moscow's underground rail system has always been the envy of the world in terms of its just sheer beauty and opulence, but not something that they would want you in America to be aware of, which in some ways is why Sputnik was so significant. Um, you know, as as Buzz Lightyear said, everything changed with these two words, Sputnik, right? Here was something travelling over your head that America couldn't do. Like, they couldn't stop the public from being aware of it. And it seriously undermined the the whole propaganda effort that was to make the Soviet Union look like, a, um, you know, it, it was some collection of peasants barely advanced beyond feudalism. It, you know your problem, Luke. You've been watching too much of that Moscow propagandist Tucker Carlson, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... I I hope Adam Curtis goes shopping at some point during the documentary. <laughs> Tishin is panicked. If Russia wins dominance of this completely new area, well, I think the consequences are fairly plain. Probable Soviet world domination. A sense of vulnerability swept America. For Laika could just as easily have been a nuclear warhead. To the military, it was a nightmare. Russia was their enemy, yet they had no idea how to defend themselves against this new weapon that might descend suddenly from outer space. Pause. Go on, yeah. So remember that the, the original use of nukes was 1945. Yes. And, and indeed, the Soviets also did tests of, of nukes basically the same year so the and, and sputnik was 1957 so you're you're talking about just over a decade after the the first nukes were, were dropped and now you've got somebody who you think of as your enemy sending things over your head and america's got no way to stop it so that that's yeah. what that's what he means about the vulnerability is yeah. we could at any anywhere in the country as far as we know, we could be destroyed at any second. Yeah, it's also interesting that these two things are things that the kook sphere loves to say don't exist. <laughs> that mm. is both the space moon stuff and nukes. There are, either, either there are conspiracy theories that neither of these two th things exist, um, which uh, I wonder if one aspect of that is the fact that there was a propaganda war at this time. So there, there were actually incentives to create propaganda on both sides around these two issues, i.e. the space race and the nuke, the nuke race, if that makes any sense. Um, which then you mean gives... you mean that the propaganda was deceptive, and in part of that deception spawned the kooks. They can trace their lineage it, it, back exactly to that. There could be some fifties. The there could be some element of psyops in there that the kooks are genuinely picking up on and then well, it sometimes it's occurred to me yeah. with the moon landing stuff that um they may be i i don't really know about this topic so i shouldn't talk about it but <laughs> what if they produced some footage that was fake just in case the moon landing didn't happen and then they went <laughs> to the moon and then yeah. they were like yeah but this footage is so good <laughs> you know we've got to put this out as well <laughs> Um, all right, so let's uh, let's carry on. Keep going. But three thousand miles away on the California coast, scientists believe they had the answers. They worked at the Rand Corporation. Rand stood for research and development. Uh, now I'll say that the Rand Corporation is probably like peak Curtis focus type institution. <laughs> he loves looking at the Rand Corporation. And um, when I was writing Populist Delusion, 
I came across several elite theory documents produced by the Rand Corporation in this era, which was kind of fascinating. And, I, and a lot of it was um, research on the Soviets. You know, if I've got one here that was produced by the, I'm trying to remember the guy's name now, but it's, uh, I, I couldn't help but notice it was published by the, put out by the Rand Corporation. Um, so it is one of those things that produces documents for elites to read, or at least it did in this era. Um, Curtis loves a group of nameless men who think that they're very important and then are proven wrong. I think the Rand Corporation was kind of the first think tank in some ways, wasn't it? it was yeah, very but, pioneering. I mean, if you're watching Adam, because there's a there's a non-zero ch chance that he might watch this one day, right? Um, I suppose so. You know, higher. Maybe than... he'll he, he'll take our conversation and recut it with different music. Well, and make us look like the my, conspiracy theorists. My question for Adam Curtis is, where's your Tony Blair Institute corporate? Uh, where's your Tony Blair Institute documentary? Mm. Where are you, where's Adam? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exposing. I mean, this is exact. This is the exact sort of thing that he should be making documentaries about now. But he's 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 become like weirdly. Oh, I'm just going to talk about Putin and Russia. I mean, in that in that hypernormalization, which we'll get to eventually, he goes so far, and then he's like, "Ah, oh, but look at all what <laughs> Vlad's up to," and I, I sometimes wonder where whether he he tells us what our elites are up to through telling us what Russia are doing in some strange way, because so many of the so many of the tactics that he outlines in in that one in hypernormalization are things that we know our elites do, uh, mm. you know containment uh, like literally funding their own dissidents and things like that you know which is all things that putin does uh in that documentary. Uh, Very interesting. But, but anyway yeah <coughs> let's go <coughs> keep going it was the first scientific think tank rand was funded by the air force but staffed by young academics who believed the scientific method could help bring the cold war back under america's control you're here at Rand in Santa Monica, California, on the Pacific Ocean, where groups of engineers, sci scientists. It, uh, just thinking, because I, I know he loves the small group of intellectuals who've got a plan, right? Pete mm -hmm. Curtis. Has Curtis ever done anything on the the Silicon Valley guys and their Ooh, kind of utopian vision? I feel, I feel like that would be something that he may have actually made something on at some point. Um, Maybe yeah. so. Because they'd be another group from California who had a utopian mm -hmm. vision uh, down the line. Mathematicians, he, political scientists. Go, go on, Luke. He, he, I was wondering if his, if his pro life project is unmasking the neocons so this new Silicon Valley group is kind of the same tactics but not his interest. I mean, yeah, I, might also I, explain I the... feel like he did. I feel like he does talk about them in one of the more recent ones. Okay. He, he talks about uh, he talks about their kind of dream of opening up the internet for everybody, but actually the internet being like a closed matrix and a form of where you can actually be tracked, which is kind of what it's become. Hi. I feel like the real the real story of the internet was that America pushed it as a platform of freedom as a way to destabilize other countries, but now it's that the freedom has started to turn against the US, then they're, they're tightening it up. Yeah, they don't want a Europe spring or a U <laughs> USA spring, only an Arab spring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It all came together to begin working on problems uh, originally of national defense and national security. The principal issue they were dealing with was trying to understand the future of American security in the nuclear age. It involved questions of technology. Uh, what would technology offer? Uh, how could it be harnessed to, to serve America's security? Science of the rigorous uh, mathematical sort. Sorry to keep on interrupting, but what do you think the average IQ in that room was versus the average <laughs> IQ of the State Department today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know which one I would back in a, a kind of group chess game. <laughs> The techniques that they were developing uh, were generally categorized as systems analytic techniques. And what this consisted of 
was getting an enormous mathematical model that could be calculated thanks to the advent of these high-speed computers. Next, what a we can store font a program choice. To compute Who the picked required that typeface? <laughs> Nobody writes maths in that kind of quirky. Of technology. <laughs> quirky maths. Yeah, by, by the way, I don't think he'll go into any of the actual maths of, of game theory. It really, it really started in the mid-40s. There was a paper by um, von Neumann called Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. Um, and that, that, I think, is what led to all these guys being so analytical. It's kind of the, it's kind of, it reminds me of the uh, calculation problem. Like the, there is an essential mm -hmm. component missing from the mathematics, which is the psychology of humans. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of just, to do game theory, you have to assume that everybody is a perfect rational actor. And unless mm -hmm. that's true, then the calculations are kind of meaningless. Yeah, and this, of course, will rearticulate in uh, rational choice theory. I think it's uh, Roland Coase, one of the Chicago guys, uh, who had this rational choice theory uh, model. Is it Roland Coase or was it was the Becker? I seem to remember. I have to go back to my uh, econ stuff now. I think it's Becker. It was one of those. It was one of those Chicago guys, anyway. Um, and basically, all their models were based on this idea of the ration, of, of people like when push comes to shove, making a rational choice, which could be as simple as you'll, you know, if given a choice between a more expensive item or a cheaper item, you'll go for the cheaper one. All other things being equal, stuff like that, you know. Um, anyway, let's carry on. Just the economists, mathematicians, who could piece all of these disciplines together and feed their inputs into this huge, complex mathematical model, it meant that the world could be understood to a degree where it could be calculated and predicted. And that's what these systems analysts proceeded to do. To the scientists at RAND, the Cold War was a totally new system of conflict. Past experience and politics were no help in predicting how the other side would behave. They turned instead to a method of predicting behavior in uncertain situations, the theory of games. It had been developed by the famous mathematician, John von Neumann. Now, now why, why do you think that they disregarded all previous history? <laughs> <laughs> this is a progressive versus um, conservative lens, isn't it? This is a... I, I remember... Um, hearing who's who's the guy with the funny speech impediment <laughs> um uh he was talking about how stupid wisdom is he's like there's nothing so dumb as wisdom oh sl um, slam oi zizek that's it zizek <laughs> the, the whole the whole lens is like because we've reached such a level of enlightenment we can we can start from base axioms and just invent everything for ourselves uh, you know to even um, to even waste time opening a book <laughs> would, would be to soil our perfect understanding of the world with troglodyte uh, st stupid ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just I mean, trying to get, be as charitable as possible. Could they be thinking, well, there's never been a situation where there, where, where there are two hegemonic powers like this of roughly equal capabilities uh, with nukes, these are all like new things. So therefore, we you know we can't really look at the British versus Napoleon or the you know the Persians and the Romans or something as some maybe you know, as some analogy, not, something like that. I, I'm not sure it's so different. If you have a an army with a hundred thousand people in it and you command it to march towards the enemy. It's it's fairly similar to a ballistic war warhead that you you can't stop. You know you just have to wait to find out who who wins, you know, and, and pick up, dust yourself off after the after the end of the conflict. Like any any battle takes place under the calculation that you're going to win but suffer enormous losses. So 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably right that they they felt that they were in a completely new era, but I I don't know how true that is. I mean, I, I'd have thought that some aspect of World War Two would have been instructive as well, but yeah. probably not. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, more well, fa famously, we killed way more people in the Berlin. Um, you know, we, when we bombed Berlin, than when we bombed Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So mm -hmm. we think of nukes as this completely new um, event where more people died uh, than ever before. But actually, it's only true as if you calculate it by a single bomb. Mm -hmm. But you could just, you could kill more people by just sending over several planes, each of which yeah, just car planes. or just carp like old fashioned carpet bombing or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> who had worked at Rand. In the 1920s in Berlin, he had watched poker games and seen how each player's strategy depended on what he thought the other side would rationally do. Von Neumann had shown how to give numerical values to the different choices and so decide on the best move. It was seen like a game. A game in which there were rational players and in which each side had certain information about the capabilities of the other side. The notion of Kriegspiel evolved at uh, Rand, which was the uh, uh, game of chess in which you don't see the opponents. Uh... I, I will say, for whatever shortcomings this way of thinking has, Luke, mm -hmm. it's surely better than the current paradigm where <laughs> we've got uh, Vladimir Putin and she and, uh, and various other actors playing chess and our leaders basically behaving like a bunch of hysterical women <laughs> i.e like i don't know what the paradigm they've got is it's just kind of like you know hyper <laughs> hyper hysteria or something uh, but yes you, you feel that the objective of the people at this time was to win whereas the objective of the people in charge of the US these days, I, I'm not convinced it is. <laughs> they, they don't intend to win. But it's interesting what he's saying here, that um, the type of game that chess is, normal conventional chess, is that it's perfect information. You know everything that your opponent knows. Whereas mm -hmm. what they're modelling here is an information game with a fog of war. So you have to work with probabilities, and that's where the models get quite complicated. Mm -hmm. And as we know, uh, once models get complicated, they they quickly diverge from reality. And uh, you know, the, generally, the the more complicated a model is, the more suspicious you should be of it. I also love the idea that all previous history is no guide, but the game mm. of poker is. <laughs> all previous mm -hmm. military conflict are of no consequence whatsoever. But the game of poker is of consequence in their in their thinking, which is kind of uh, odd, an odd way of thinking, I think. But so, anyway, <clears throat> uh, pieces. You have two chess boards, each complete, with a blind between them, and uh, you have to presume from indirect information where the uh, opponent's chess pieces are, and then make the best judgment you can to get more information. Rand's strategists studied every piece of information they could find about the Soviet Union. They even wrote their own operational code of the Politburo and commissioned the famous anthropologist Margaret Mead to study the Russian attitude to authority. From this came complex mathematical models that showed the Air Force the best possible moves. But in the process, the idea of the Cold War as a political conflict that could be resolved was fading away. It became instead a mechanical system in which all parts worked according to rational laws, and that included the enemy. So the strategist's job was to keep it balanced in equilibrium. The most influential figure at Rand was Albert Wellstetter, a mathematical logician. He was also a devoted fan of modern architecture and abstract design, and a close friend of the famous architect Le Corbusier. Wallstetter saw the system of conflict as dangerously unstable. He was convinced the Soviet Union might attack, not because it wanted to, but because the rational logic of the system would force it to pull the trigger first. I drew Pause. the analogy 
with them. So I think that they're alluding to the Nash equilibrium here. And the, the idea is that you can have a situation in a game where both players know what their best move is and what the opponent's best move is. And because it's all settled and everybody's best move is clear, it's stable. So when they're then talking about instability, that's what you want to avoid. So you, you actually want to you want to drive the game state to a position where everybody can predict everyone else's moves, which then fosters a strange kind of trust, even though you're mm -hmm. even though you're dealing with your enemies. Yeah. Because you each understand each other, then you can you can kind of play your hand confidently. <coughs> you know, <coughs> taking this seriously for a second, do you think the fall of the Soviet Union was actually the worst thing that ever happened for our regime? Because <laughs> suddenly this equilibrium was out and they believed they were all powerful. And now, if you have a look at how they're dealing with Russia now, which is basically the same enemy, let's not forget, right? They don't do any of that. They, they, it's, there's now no consideration or understanding of the enemy whatsoever. And so they're consistently, you know, making bad predictions or, you know, provoking or, I don't know, they're just, they're playing a different game now, if they're playing a game at all. Yeah, again, I, I would put it down to that the objectives are no longer clear in Washington. I think you could pretty easily have figured out. I mean, most people who were looking at it seriously at the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine understood that that, that both sides should come to the negotiating table, mm -hmm. and that didn't happen. And I, I don't think that comes down to a lack of... I mean, as much as we make fun of the analysts um, in the White House, the, I don't think they... I don't think they can possibly be that stupid, can they? I don't think they can. Well, I mean, they did deliberately sabotage those negotiations. Let's not forget our very right. own Boris Johnson went over there to do that. So, you know. Yeah, but then that I I think that indicates a different objective rather than a. I, I don't think it was a fumble. I tend generally to assume that people are normally making the best move in their position given their objectives. So if something looks surprising, it's because they had different information to you or they have different objectives to what you expect. Yeah. But they they, they are treating Putin as a, kind of, as a kind of absolute evil, unassimilable, no negotiation, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, they're, they're dealing with it in a very different way to how the, mm -hmm. these guys were thinking about in, in Cold War era. Anyway, mm -hmm. let's carry on. <laughs> Western gun duel. The gunman and the sheriff were not necessarily morally were not morally equivalent in any in any sense, but they each might find themselves in a position where they'd had to draw first in order to survive. And uh, and this would be a rational act if they found themselves in that position. And so I wanted to design a posture where it would never made sense for an adversary in his own terms to attack. Wallstetter invented what were to become the familiar icons of the nuclear age. He proposed that hundreds of missiles should be protected in concrete silos underground. Fleets of bombers were to be in the air 24 hours a day, controlled by a system he designed called Failsafe. The aim was to convince the Soviets that if they attacked, America would always have enough missiles left to destroy them in return. The Cold War would become safer by stabilizing what Wallstetter called the delicate balance of terror. I should mention, by the way, I, I quite like the aesthetics of this era. I'm guessing this is mm. mid, this is like mid-century modern. <laughs> so, I, so I like a lot of these aesthetics. So whether it's the uh, various interiors that we've seen, or some of this more kind of industrial mil military stuff as well, 
just yeah. looks looks cool to me as well. Yeah, I agree. There are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of your of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But in order for both of us, for both of us to benefit, for both of us to benefit. As America's politicians became increasingly intimidated by the Soviets, the strategists exercised a restraining influence. They argued that the enemy was dangerous, but rational. It was not a satanic monster that had to be destroyed. We have the resources, intelligence, and courage to make the correct decisions. There were real dangers, real dangers of the... This guy's got an amazing voice and should have uh, yes. recorded, he should have recorded lots. You know those old like Morgan Freeman nature oh, documentaries yeah. or whatever? Yeah. He should have recorded some of them. <laughs> He's got a great voice. It is an interesting question. Subversion, why um, have there only ever been right. two nukes used in anger? Like yes, it... well, I mean, I did tell you before that uh, at the last event, me and Panama Hat stayed up till 5 a.m. one night. And after gaming it out, we figured out that nukes just can't ever be used. So even they if were they, twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah what, they can never Since be used. Ag, i.e., they can never be used again. And mm. so, even if they're real, which there's every mm. reason to believe, right? They can't actually be used. So it's like a uniquely theoretical. It's like a it's like a uniquely theoretical <laughs> weapon in a way. Because it just can't be. I mean, let's just pretend, right? Just pretend now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Putin decides to, I don't know, nuke Kiev. I mean, he can't do it, can he? How is he going to? Or, I don't know, Israel decides to use their nuke on, on Hezbollah or something. Mm -hmm. Like, they just, like, every, the entire world would immediately condemn them. And the other people who have nukes would immediately nuke them. So it's the, just, it's just yeah, the fear easy. is always <laughs> that somebody would get their hands on nukes who was irrational. So, I mean, that was partly also the um, the the justification for going into Iraq, right? Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, and he's insane, and therefore MAD will no longer work. I mean, have you so seen all of the absolute tin pot dictators Pakistan have had? Pakistan's been in nuclear <laughs> power for ages. <laughs> Not what like or 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 North Korea. Not not one yeah. of these guys thought. Aha! I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the bomb. It's because right. it's it's just literally practically unfeasible to do it because it well, means and, certain destruction for everybody, right? So it's just <laughs> it can never be yeah, used. Hasn't there also been several incidents where there was uh, some command or some sighting that would mean the U.S. had to launch their nukes and the the person who was responsible for doing the launch just didn't press the button. And, and so, yeah, even if you had a mad dictator, then you could argue you've still got to have several layers of, you know, military personnel also be mad and self-destructive. Yeah, my understanding, and I'm not a nuclear <laughs> physicist or anything like that, as I'm sure everybody knows, but my understanding is that it's not as simple as just pressing a big red button. That that there are actually quite a lot of controls to go through. Now, people um, are saying it was know. in Russia, apparently. The Stanislav I, I, Petrov incident. But what I'm saying is, is that it, it's not just one person touching a button, right? Oh, I'm launching yeah. the new. It's actually a huge, like a huge process that you have to go through, and lots of people I are think, involved and things like that. Yes, yeah, so I think it's designed right. to have a process i don't i don't think there's a technical reason it's difficult you know you could wire it up to a single button press but it's been it, it's in practice been put behind a certain amount of process and red tape can you be in, but the, can you imagine being the last guy right <laughs> the question is good <laughs> to go back to the the game theory question which the documentary is about if you believe that so Suppose you're going. Suppose you you actually do want to fire your nukes at Russia. What if you What if you realised that the people in Russia who were part of that chain, 
who saw the the radar detection and thought that there were nukes coming from the US would chicken out and not launch theirs and just <laughs> choose to believe that it was like a fake, you know, it was some kind of cyber attack, you know. Right, yeah. yeah. So then it kind of destroys the mad because if they don't actually think that the nukes are coming, you can you can launch yours, right? So so actually putting in place lots of processes and lots of people in a weird way weakens your security because it's only if you can really look your opponent in the eyes and yeah. and make he thinks that you're going to do it that's the only way that the truce holds yeah but then like what happens on day 2 okay right now you've done it i blow i've i've nuked moscow okay yeah. Now, now that now, but now you have to face the entire world, your entire population being like, "Holy shit, you've just nuked Moscow!" <laughs> I mean, it's just like it's not like it's just completely inconceivable. That's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, anyway, let's, yeah, let's... yeah. I, I could, I could imagine the tin pot dictator doing it. I could, I could actually see. You know, North Korea firing a nuke at Japan just as a like <laughs> completely mad Tuesday. Let's, uh, let's get on. Attack on, a more military attack on Europe. Our aim was to design a more stable balance. But the rise of the strategists was only part of the changes brought about by the Cold War. After Sputnik and the Cold War started, then they started developing all of these missiles. All of the companies would bid for them and build them, and they'd bring them out here and test them. From, like, the Patriots, 16 years, and it's been tested, still testing it. They're adding to it now to make it reach out further. Here is the cruise missile. It was here. That was the meanest looking one that I've ever seen. To see something like that was out of this world, it was unreal. Lift off. In 1961, the influence of the men from Rand increased dramatically. The new president, John F. Kennedy, turned to them to impose order, not only on nuclear strategy, but on the arms race, which was threatening to run out of control. Kennedy was convinced the scientific method was the key to solving the problems of modern industrialized societies. I believe the Soviet Union is first in outer space. We may have made more shots at the size of their rocket thrust and all the rest. You yourself said to Khrushchev, you may be ahead of us in rocket thrust, but we're ahead of you in color television. I think that color television is not as important as rocket thrust. Leading members of the RAND Corporation were asked to become the aides of the new Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. McNamara had previously run the Ford Motor Company and used systems analysis to rationalize production. Now he told the strategists to do the same with America's defense. I should just mention here that Robert McNamara is one of the few rare double heels in history, Luke. I.e. he has two massive top heel runs this one here <laughs> where he basically like masterminds all of vietnam right and then he becomes the president of the world bank from wow. 1968 to 1981 so he he is not only responsible for That's vietnam insane. but oversaw like the construction of the you know the uh the gay architecture if you want to put it that way so extremely uh influential and powerful man <clears throat> they were no longer advisors to the military, they had become the masters. But they had hardly begun work when they received some astonishing news. A new reconnaissance satellite showed that far from having 600 missiles, as the Air Force had claimed, the Soviets had only four. It was severely embarrassing for the strategists, because the Air Force figures had been the basis of much of their work. The Air Force intelligence inputs were mainly parochial, and they were designed to make out the, the enemy 
principally the Soviets, at their very worst, because if they did that, the Air Force would get ever so many billions of dollars to build more airplanes, more missiles, more everything. And so these analysts were being misled from the very beginning. For years, the Air Force had been showing slides of Russian monasteries and war memorials, claiming they were missile silos in disguise. The awkward question now was whether RAND studies were equally fictitious. But the strategists were undeterred. The Russians had fewer missiles, and the satellite showed where they were. So it would be possible, if a nuclear war happened, to mount selective strikes and thus control and even win the conflict. Mm, what do you this say to was that? Then? Combating the notion that uh, there was only one big spasm kind of war, and once things started, all you did was shut your eyes, close your ears, <laughs> fire everything. Uh, I was once doing a study in the Pentagon with the people who were responsible for getting all the data about nuclear detonations anywhere on the continent. And I asked the question, how do you tell when the war is over? And it looked as if the question had never occurred to them before. And I thought, well, this is, this is important, that somebody must be attending to how the war will be ended, as well as simply to how to start it efficiently. Under the strategist's new plans, Soviet military targets would be annihilated first. America's remaining missiles would be held back to threaten Russia's cities and force the Soviet government into submission. The most notorious proponent of these plans was Herman Kahn. He had left Rand and set up his own think tank, the Hudson Institute. He looks like the penguin out of Batman or something like that, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Herman Kahn, so, all right. Go, go on, Luke, so sorry. I was going to say, I, I guess the thing they're talking about here is that if, if you can set up a way to have a limited engagement where you can kind of hash it out with a little bit of a conflict and then cool off and count your chickens and return to an icy kind of peace rather than just going for all out war there's some there's some value in having that as an option almost like a uh, a middle ground between total war and yeah. And Cold War, like a, a, a lukewarm war, I guess. <laughs> yeah, li 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 some sort of limited engagement. Yeah. So bonkers, that miscalculation that you just talked about. I mean, they, they, I think they overestimated the size of the Russian arsenal by, like, <laughs> order of, like, 100% or something ridiculous. It was more than that, wasn't it? Like, 400%. They, they, they thought they had 600 and there's only four. Is that right? What did yeah, you say? so ha how many... I guess this is an interesting question. So suppose you had enough nukes to c completely depopulate Russia, and they just had one nuke that could hit <laughs> that could hit Washington. <laughs> you still probably wouldn't fire them, right? So you don't actually need equal amounts of nukes. You you just need like enough each to make I, the pain too too great. To I, I'm convinced it's a purely theoretical weapon that just can't be used under any circumstances. <laughs> I, I, well, people talk about uh, smaller nuclear arms as part of a normal military engagement. Like, you know, instead of dropping the Tsar's bomber, you, you could just, like, it's, suppose that we had World War Three. like, maybe your carpet bombing involves a, sm a few small-scale nukes, and that just becomes normal, and pe people accept that's just part of modern, modern war, you know? I mean, if that happens, the world's gone anyway. So that's literally <laughs> nuclear Armageddon. Oh, yeah, it's a couple of small nukes, you know? I mean, come on. It's just not going to happen, is it? Let's make sure. Near well, I mean, I, yeah, maybe. He was convinced a controlled nuclear war was possible. Just because you go to war, that itself may be an irrational act, or may not. But even if you irrationally decide to go to war, it doesn't mean you have to fight it in a wildly irrational fashion. Many people feel that even if they survive a nuclear war, that things are going to be so awful and life is going to be so destroyed everywhere that they'd actually rather be dead. That's a uh, almost completely standard reaction, and it's really a reaction to try to prevent thinking about the subject. And uh, I make a comment which always gets me in a great deal of criticism. Let me make it anyway. Uh, objective studies uh, literally indicate that the post-war environment, while hostile to human life, more hostile than the pre-war environment, will not be so hostile as to 
quote, preclude normal and happy lives. The institute. So, so was he suggesting that if there was like a nuclear, if there was a nuclear exchange, the fallout wouldn't be so bad that people like, I don't know, let's just pretend Washington is bombed. People in New York are still going about their lives as normal. So don't worry about it. Type thing. What was he saying? Yeah, I, I mean, if I, I guess we're used to thinking in apocalyptic terms where once something gets sufficiently bad, we just can't even process or calculate what happens next. Yeah, but yeah in re you know, in reality, like if you if you didn't know the history of Japan and you went and visited there, it wouldn't occur to you that they'd been that, that two of their cities had been nuked. Like you can bounce back <coughs> from quite serious depopulation. Oh, well, I have to admit that my entire thinking on this subject is entirely primed by Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And, and the scene, <laughs> yeah. and the, you know, uh, Sarah Connor has that kind of nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> and all the kids in the park. Are just kind of <laughs> that's, right. that's, my, that's my entire vision of nuclear <laughs> well, the, the The kind of all of humanity is dead forever argument is... is, is is kind of related, but not exactly the same thing as as what they're dealing with in the Cold War. Because in the Cold War, they're thinking about um, global dominance, civilizational victory. The other argument that this campaign for nuclear disarmament people would talk about is: what if the atmosphere gets so irradiated that all life on Earth is <laughs> ceases to exist? You know, um, so it's kind of similar to the climate change stuff. What if X, Y, Z, just end of life, and therefore anything that we ask for becomes immediately necessary. So I, I kind of think the the arguments about whether it could be used in a military way is kind of a more interesting and grown up conversation than yeah. the with the bombed back to the Stone Age concept. John, I know now why you cry. See, isn't it's amazing that. Do you, want, do you want a part in my play? That kind of uh, I mean, this is the, acting chops. This is the, this is the age we live in, though. Most of my yeah. imagination is formed by a, a a shitty action movie from 1992. <laughs> do you think? Do you think Hollywood movies were part of? And this is probably a rhetorical question, but do you think they were part of the propaganda effort from the U.S. at that time? Of course they were. Did of did they, I mean... um did the script get a look over by the CIA? I'm sure anything made by that particular director was his camp was it Cameron? Yeah, it was Cameron, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that particular director had all his scripts checked by the CIA. Because <laughs> all his movies are kind of, you know. Did didn't he direct aliens as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's let's carry on anyway. Dude <clears throat> is now deserted. But in the early sixties it was full of men and women working out what to do if the worst happened. Cities on both sides were given precise values. Then scenarios were constructed, like equations, showing what to do in any eventuality. There's an accident. <coughs> we drop a bomb on Kiev. It was a fluke. We didn't mean to. The Russians believe we didn't mean to. Then there's a negotiation about where can we drop a bomb on something that's of equal value of Kiev. If we drop the bomb, we can stop now. You know, if we destroy something equal, you've got a sort of a... But that if you is escalate, well. if you go from our equivalent of Kiev to uh, New York, our equivalent of Moscow, it's a very big escalation. Yeah. <laughs> Notice it this was like Kiev back then, not Kiev. This is well, yeah. <laughs> this, this, but this is like um, a slapping competition. Can you yeah. imagine that actually that negotiation actually happening? So sorry, uh, <laughs> so, so, sorry, Pennsylvania. But we've agreed to let the Soviets nuke you. <laughs> in a controlled nuclear war, populations of cities would become like pawns in a game of bargaining with nuclear weapons. So the strategists persuaded America's leaders to take civil defense seriously. Now that we're convinced that Russia can deliver a devastating weapon here to the San Fernando Valley, and that the majority of the radioactivity is short-lived, how can we protect ourselves against this particular hazard? We must have concentrated... Herman Kahn believed that America's cities would have to be evacuated two or three times a decade 
as America played brinkmanship with the Soviet Union. Everyone would have to be taught to think rationally about nuclear war. I can remember growing up having dinner table discussions about, let us assume something happens. We go down in our bomb shelter. We can support six or 10 or 12 people in the shelter. The neighbors start banging on the door. <laughs> let us in, let our children in. These women don't seem real, Luke. <laughs> they look like they're in an art piece. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a play. It looks like a kind of 80s play or something. <laughs> it's, they yeah. don't seem like real women. It's very odd. <laughs> Especially that one who's standing up. It's like an absurdist uh -huh. take on the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> Who do we let in? That's sort of unthinkable when you're 10 years old or 9 years old. I mean, that's what I remember growing up discussing things like that because it was possible. If it was possible, it was worthy to talk about, you know, rather than just saying, well, you throw up your hands and say it's unthinkable. These analysts uh, were human beings. They were no ordinary human beings. They had more than a smattering of megalomaniacs, uh, Herman Kahn being one of them, Albert Wolstetter, uh, another megalomaniac. It was this feeling that they could gain control and a huge degree of power by doing these studies. And so these analysts indeed achieved their grandiose dream. They were in full control. Then, as if on cue, a crisis occurred that seemed the perfect test for these theories. In October 1962, America discovered the Soviet Union was sighting nuclear missiles in Cuba. The question was how to force them to stop. To the strategists, it was a clear opportunity for their scenarios. While journalists waited outside, President Kennedy's cabinet met to decide whether to attack Cuba. Did you want to say something? Sorry. I was going to say that this is the year after the Berlin Wall went up, and obviously Cuba's right in firing line of America. So this is highly... I'm sure everybody already knows about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but uh, yeah, talking about it as a perfect, a perfect case to experiment with their theories is kind of wild. Yeah, if you're wondering, by the way, yes, Herman Kahn... Um... Well, you can guess his background. Not from Brooklyn, though. He's from the Bronx. But he, Gone! He was an immigrant from Eastern Europe, and he's, he was raised in a certain type of background. Um, the uh, His fellow physicist, Samuel Cohen, also was uh, from a similar background, as was William Kaufman. Um, and Cohen and Kaufman? Cohen and Kaufman. You wouldn't have guessed. And Khan, they're they're all uh, they're all of this uh, of this type. Let's just say, let's, let's carry on. Something else to keep an eye on with Curtis, by the way, is uh, some of the individuals he focuses on often have this sort of thing in, in common. Let's just say, but he he never points this out. Their discussions were recorded. The tapes show a group of men facing the reality of a nuclear crisis. As the strategists had told them, it was a game of bargaining. But confronted by the need for action, they found they had no idea how the other side would respond to any move they made. They weren't even sure if the other side was rational. It seems to me almost certain that any one of these forms of direct military action will lead to a Soviet military response of some type, some place in the world. But uh, they may be thinking that they can either bargain Berlin and Cuba against each other, or that uh, they could provoke us into a kind of action in Cuba, which would give an umbrella for them to take action with respect to Berlin. If they could provoke us into taking the first overt action, then the world would be confused and they would have uh, what they would consider to be justification for making the move somewhere else. For the first time, I'm beginning really to wonder whether Mr. Khrushchev was entirely rational about Berlin. As the crisis escalated, that, uh, the prospect in a way, Cuba is the Ukraine of the US, right? It's kind of yeah, like very, a, very much, very much so, yeah. And that's and, the and then I was thinking, a lot of people. Have well, made. can you imagine if the US invaded Cuba? 
But actually, they did, didn't they? There was the Bay of Pigs just just a yeah. short time before this. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yes, just to kind of highlight the disparate reactions. No, nobody remembers the U.S. as awful, authoritarian, evil land grabbers for trying to invade Cuba. Yeah, it, it, there's also the. Um, do you remember we were talking about how you know, remember I made it another way of reading George Wells' Nineteen Eighty Four? Mm -hmm. Is that Curtis has got a way of showing just how totalitarian the American system was and is? Um, because viewed from the outside, this looks like a very totalitarian system as well. Um, you know, with and you, you're literally seeing elites making top-down plans which then affect normal people who have to do things like evacuate their towns or whatever you know so mm. <clears throat> he shows us that he shows that pretty well to nuclear war became very real if it happened the strategists elaborate plans were supposed to offer the president ways to control it well i must say i was scared to death that we were going to get ourselves in a nuclear exchange uh and i wasn't sure until the, the final a culmination of the thing that 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 we were going to escape that uh, I think we took a hell of a chance so if that nuclear exchange had happened do you think it could have been controlled in the way the strategists argued no I think uh, uh, we had testimony from these characters by day and night on how do you how do you contain a nuclear exchange I never believed any of it half or three quarters of Los Angeles has been destroyed well how are you going to continue to live well, the first thing we have to recognize is that if half of Los Angeles is destroyed, maybe 80, 90 percent of the people will be dead, and there will be fewer mouths to feed, and those those of us who will survive will... It's a base way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> ...have more Sounds water great. and food to divide up. Well, isn't this a very good argument from a purely selfish point of view of not wanting uh, many people to make shelters? This is true, but on the other hand, those of us who have been building shelters, we believe for the most part that if we as citizens do something to demonstrate that we are prepared to withstand an attack, the Russians or whoever it is will be less likely to launch an attack against us. In the end, President Kennedy ignored any idea of controlled war. Instead, he told the Russians that if they launched just one missile from Cuba, he would retaliate with America's entire arsenal. <laughs> Sorry, it's just all this in the JFK is like nope. Um ignore. <laughs> ignore all of that bullshit. I'm going JFK in. Yes, the managerial <laughs> response. <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> Screw your up kicks. I'm I I'm Irish after all, you know. Um. <laughs> to the strategists, what, what? this threat <laughs> How do we rate JFK, by the way? Like do, what do you think of him as a president? <laughs> well, I, I made I made a tweet the other day which annoyed a lot of people. Where because again, JFK is like really, really venerated by not only like the kook sphere who absolutely love JFK because he made this one speech where he talked about secret societies, right? Mm. <clears throat> and they've got this idea that he wanted to stop uh, the Israelis getting nukes, which is probably true. Um, but also he is highly venerated by like Tucker Carlson and um kind of uh you know people he kind of went out in his people. prime like a rock star mm. didn't he but and, and potentially you know killed by some of shared enemies yeah. right but from my point of view he's just another shitlib president he's just a shitlib come on there's nothing like I, I feel like a lot of stuff comes from wanting to claim one leader as based or, oh, he was our guy or something. He wasn't. He's just another one of them. You don't get to become the president. I remember doing a stream where they literally cheated in 1960 to get him in, in Chicago. Do you remember that? Yeah, so you can't be, you, you can't be a total enemy of the system if the system is helping you along like that, right? He became the president. So... Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I, I but, I but that's know. kind of a there's a level of cope in in being able to find based presidents that gives well, you some. I, I think a lot of what it is is that the it's not so much of what JFK did, but what he represented to boomers when they were kids. Right. 
there are, he's a symbol of a better time. He's a symbol of, you know, he wanted to do the right thing. He was kind of blue, blue eyed and, you know, he had that kind of optimism about him. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's, he's got a special place in the, in the boomer hearts, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or someone like Tucker Carlson say that like, he's a symbol of the America that they remember type thing. Um, I, I'd rather valorize course... JFK than Churchill, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's better than Churchill, but that's not saying a lot. That's not saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would say there have been no good presidents <laughs> since the war, since FDR, and also no good prime ministers since Churchill either. That's my view. But... <laughs> it was irrational and humiliating. My only recollection is of one of disappointment. I mean, President Kennedy indicated that the United States had the capability to engage in massive retaliation, which led several of us to wonder uh, why he had used this particular language and why he hadn't uh, gone to what at least we thought of as the more powerful and rational approach to deterrence. It seemed to me that it would be utter folly for us to go in what one of my colleagues, Herman Kahn, called a wargasm and try and destroy everything we could because, in effect, that would sign the death warrant of the United States. I mean, I, I do think there's a deeper and more esoteric reason, uh, Luke, as well, which is that I believe that in JFK's time, the office of the president had a lot more power mm -hmm. than it than it would come. And mm -hmm. um, it was really during LBJ's time and certainly after Nixon's time that the uh, what people call the deep state, you know, truly kind of, cuck the office of the president and these kind of permanent interests the swamp as trump calls them um so i mean there is there is some truth to that i would say that jfk had greater autonomy in the office than subsequent presidents would have had um i mean by the time you get to bill clinton i mean you literally have like his office crawling with Mo mossad spies like known mossad agents tapping the White House and nothing is done about it because he's a man of low moral fiber and they got the goods on him, you know, Monica, Lew Monica Lewinsky and all of that. So, and do, also, do you... and also the American public had degraded to the point where nobody just, by that, by that time, nobody even gave a shit about anything anyway. So anyway, carry on. <laughs> do you think a Carlylean great man <laughs> in the presidency could drain the swamp? Is Is it even conceivably possible at this point oh yeah oh yeah if, if if he had enough um if he had enough support in the military and if he got the right team in place uh he could do it really really easily using ex various executive orders and i mean all he needs is the right people in place to execute those orders and yeah he could do it how, how about the uk if if our next <laughs> Um, monarch were sufficiently based. Could could we return to being a, a monarchy in the UK? No, no, no because um, we'd be invaded by America immediately. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> so so that, that that is a that is the reality of the situation. Okay. But somebody determined enough and with big enough cojones, hmm. um, you know, they could do it. But then again, they could be taken out very quickly. It, well, they really mm. need the right people in key positions to, um, and just be prepared to like take the risk of going out like a hero, you know, yeah. getting JFK if you want to put it that way. So, <laughs> all nice. right. The Russians backed down and America celebrated. But Cuba had shown, like a flash of lightning on a dark night, how the Cold War really worked through fear, not reason. Robert McNamara began to back away from the elaborate plans for controlling nuclear war. Yet the strategists remained influential. Politicians found their rational approach irresistible. I think the Americans have, have made a kind of theology about uh, using scientific means to solve political problems. The belief that 
that this is a kind of substitute for religion, that, uh, that you, you turn to these mysterious forces which we've now begun to harness for the first time, and we can use them, and we, well, therefore we become a master of everything and we don't have to worry about others. Society is a place where every child can find knowledge to enrich his mind and to enlarge his talents. It is a place where leisure is a welcome chance to build and reflect, not a feared cause of boredom and restlessness. It is a place where the city of man serves not only the needs of the body and the In 1964, of commerce, President Johnson promised a new approach to government which would solve deep-rooted social problems such as poverty. Its architects were to be the systems analysts from RAND. President Johnson had a vision of a society which would be glorious. And he saw in the uh, analytical strength, the rationality that, that was being applied in some of the military problems, a, a, an aid, a force that could be applied also in the civilian areas. And so we were uh, apostles. Uh, we were apostles of rationality. We were to go out and apply those techniques and methods of thinking to civilian problems. To this is a very fancy way of saying, give the black population a shitload of gibs and watch how it doesn't solve any problems whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, LBJ has got to be the worst president ever, but anyway, let's carry on. Bring to bear systematic, rational thinking to them. And, and we believe that they were solvable problems. They were not insoluble. On the President's orders, many of the men who had gone from RAM to the Pentagon now moved on into other areas of government. They had become all-powerful courtiers in an age of reason. Their methods were being used to build a better world in America. As their power increased, so did their ambitions. Their techniques, they said, could even predict the future. Control, 20% probability. So one, yes, here's the unlikely event that became true, and I just go on through the others the same way. It's worth mentioning here, Luke, because somebody has in the chat, that if you watch the previous episode of Pandora's Box, the engineer's plot, that was all about rational calculation in mm. the Soviet Union. And what mm. Curtis is doing here is showing basically the exact same mindset in America at, exa at exactly the same time. Um, Very you know, it's interesting. Basically, the same, isn't it? He's quite poetic the way he's the way he's approaching it. Yeah. I wonder though if it, can you really take the same principles of game theory and apply them to Gibbs and not come <laughs> to the conclusion of what actually happened? I don't know. It seems kind of crazy that the same people who were pioneering this stuff didn't think about. Okay, so if we incentivize people, for example, to be single mothers, <laughs> is that really going to lead to social stability, right? Yeah, I, I don't really under. I mean, I've never really understood the great society stuff, um, no. and I, I don't know how it. I don't know how leftists. I, I I don't know if in mainstream left world they act as if the great society was a great success and that LBJ is a great president. I don't know. But, I, mean, clearly, I don't know either. I would bet they say, or oh, didn't go far enough. Kind of I mean, clearly, step clearly, in the right direction. it was a catastrophic failure, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure that leftists now probably just say, oh, did you know that LBJ used the N word so he was a racist or whatever, you know. Mm. That's, that's probably that's the level that they are at now. But anyway, let's carry on. This is not a crap game. It's a serious game. Rolling the dice is Dr. Olaf Helmer of the RAND Corporation. He is conducting a simulation exercise. A panel of experts has studied a list of possible 21st century developments, from personality control drugs to household robots. They have estimated the numerical probability of each. The current fascination of a new intellectual breed, the futurists. By the way, the visual here is quite strong with rolling the dice. It looks like Dungeons yeah. and Dragons or something. It, and it's it does, kind of yeah. A, it's it's kind of a powerful image of playing games in order to run your economy. But we still like 
the, there's still an enormous amount of government decision making made this exact same way. They just roll yeah. the dice inside a computer. If you ever hear someone describing a Monte Carlo simulation, yeah, that yeah. is that is just like millions of dice rather than a couple that you roll on the table. Um, I'd argue yeah. that the kinds of the kinds of models these people are doing, where they're only rolling a couple of dice, arguably they might have thought about the limitations of the method more so than a big black box that that has kind of theoretically magical powers like mm -hmm. actually being able to see the dice being rolled demystifies the the concept that still exists yeah I, also thinking about the image of the of the dice roll versus what we saw last week with the soviet union the image of the soviet union is the massive stack of books with all the with all the fixed prices huh. Here are yeah. all the prices in the economy that we have rationally fixed. So there is a difference in the U.S. approach. The U.S. Mm -hmm. approach is probability based, whereas the um, the Soviet approach was exact. There was no probability. It was just like this is the price, or you know. Mm. Um, anyway, let's carry on. <clears throat> the following features: we have fertility control, a hundred-year lifespan, controlled thermonuclear power. Continued automation, genetic control, man-machine symbiosis, household robots, wideband communications, opinion control, and continued urbanization. I would guess in 100, certainly less than 200 years, if things go at all well, 90, 95% of the world's people will be living at higher than the current American standards of living. Your men will go from everywhere poor, everywhere in danger of hunger, starvation, to a life in which the technology largely insulates you from nature. But at what but cost? At the very moment when the men from Rand were... I mean, standards uh, of living have kind of risen. I would just ask uh, whether, you know, everything important in life can be measured numerically. You know, does, does your life merely consist in the, the food that you eat and the clothes that you wear? Or maybe in the process of... Uh, Heading towards this supposed utopia, did you did you sacrifice your soul? I don't know. An awful lot of people can't buy a house, so. Well, there's also the <laughs> secondary argument of like, have we actually become material? We've got. It's, we've kind of. Um, I I think of it more like we're satiated with sugar and salt and fat and heat, whilst not having any control or power or possessions mm -hmm. i mean the the thing of you remember the um the wefs promo video that that coined the phrase you you will own nothing and you will be happy which was yeah. seen as like a prediction into the future but i think you could also see that video as more of a commentary on the current situation like people are you know, like it's effectively impoverished and yet satiated like they're they're "Quote unquote happy." If you measure happy by hedonic pleasure, they have kind of got access to porn and mindless entertainment, and and so they're kind of in a like drug addicted state, happy, uh, but they don't really own anything anymore. Like their ancestors probably had a plot of land on a feudal estate <laughs> that they, you know, they, they had some sense of ownership over, even. Let alone if if their ancestors were actually the the gentry. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm just having, sorry. I'm just having a look now at real GDP per capita adjusted for inflation over time, mm -hmm. and um, like the GDP of Pakistan and Nigeria, for example, today are less than the GDP of Australia in 1967. Interesting. So it's basically I, I, not true, is it? But he did say 200 but, but, he did say 200 years to be fair. So give him a bit of time. But also I I mean I find GDP almost a, a meaningless number. I can't can't really compute that. I Well, I, I mean I I, I've done a number of videos where I've calculated Median yeah. income versus average prices, mm -hmm. right? Or real prices in the economy, i.e., yeah. as a percentage of um, your one-hour wage, 
how much mm-hmm. is a Big Mac or how much is a, a shoe or whatever. And um, I have actually found that the prices today are do not compare that well with prices 20 years ago, for example. What if you uh, take into account that a large number of people are doing no work and yet are given free houses and food and such? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true, I suppose. Um, but then on, on the flip side, the people who do work, often you have both people working as opposed true. to just one just one person working. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's different ways of looking at it, but it's... Uh, yeah. I would say it's a deep, it's a dubious claim. Uh, if you anyway. were, if you were to be born in the UK at any time in history, which year would you pick? Um, it's a kind of slightly Rawlsian question. <laughs> yeah, difficult, difficult one. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I quite fancy the little period just before World War One. I. I think that was probably mm-hmm. a peak, peak era to live. Uh, you know, the it depends on your social class, of course. You know, but I, well, I reckon, yes, yes. I, I reckon Let's almost you're a median. I reckon almost every factor of I reckon you'd just be a lot happier living in that time than now. Um, That's still relatively recent in terms of human history. Like you're giving a lot of credit to modernity there. Yeah. Oh well, thirteen eighty one, John Smith. Don't forget. Could, exactly. It could be him. You know. But, uh, yeah, but you don't. You don't choose that. You choose nineteen oh five. I don't know. I, I kind of. I I've always liked the uh, kind of uh, late Victorian, Edwardian kind of aesthetics. You know, um, mm. Mm. it's my love of Mary Poppins, Luke. Ah, no, I understand. <laughs> anyway, you're, let's... you're the reincarnated uh, George yes. Banks. <laughs> George Banks promising America a utopia. Their whole approach was about to meet its nemesis. See, look, look, there are still people in the chat saying this is the best time. Now is the time I want to be alive. I just can't understand that argument. <laughs> I just let—I literally cannot understand anybody who says now. It just, well, there's just... quite a lot of there's quite a lot of stuff that we've got very used to today that would be difficult to wean yourself of. Um, I once I once went on holiday without my phone in the last couple of years, and it was a strange experience because. I you know habitually was was checking where's it gone. Mm-hmm. I I listen through like I have my headphones in probably like more than fifty percent of my waking hours. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it, it it's it's like a drug to kick a lot of. It's an, it's an addiction, yeah. It's an shock. addiction. Yeah. yeah, but my experience was that after a day or two. I, I literally felt like I had time traveled back to a somewhat idyllic feeling of, oh, this is what this is what my childhood was like. You yeah, know, I, I kind of re unlocked bits uh, of my brains. Not having the stupid phone on you. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. And uh, in fact, I, I mean, my, my phone's got a yellow case, as, as you'll know, because you saw it at the event. And mm. uh, Mrs. AA calls it the, the yellow devil. <laughs> and um, AAA. Triple A have picked up on that, so uh. if we're out, she'll always say, "Put away the yellow devil, put away the." Yellow... <laughs> and it kind of, <laughs> I don't know, it kind of resonates in a way because it is, yeah. it is a, it is a yellow devil, you know. But anyway, yeah. let's, go, let's carry on. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson began a bombing campaign of North Vietnam. The targets were chosen for their psychological value, pawns in a game of persuading the communists to withdraw from the South. It was inspired by the work of Rand's leading exponent of game theory, Thomas Schelling. It was a war in which we were attempting to intimidate an enemy into discontinuing what he was doing, uh, in which it was believed that if you made it painful enough for the North Vietnamese, they would call off their campaign. So I think there may have been plenty in, in my writings that people thought applied to this kind of war because this was a uh, vicious, violent bargaining process. And the effort was to convince the other side that we could tolerate more pain and damage than they could. But the communists did not behave in a rational way and retreat. 
Reluctantly, the strategists of the Pentagon agreed to send thousands of American troops. Do you think there's any connection between this rational analysis of the world and Machiavelli and and your formulation of of how rulers behave because there's a certain sense in which they are saying the only thing that matters is material concerns everybody is the same their mm -hmm. I, their beliefs don't matter their ideals don't matter you can just treat everybody like a rational actor um whereas mm -hmm. Adam Curtis here is kind of arguing that that's not true in fact, people people have these idiosyncratic beliefs and ways of life mm -hmm. that, that mean that they don't react in this predictable, straightforward, power-hungry way. Um, what I'd say is, I mean, the stuff I take from Pareto in particular, Pareto actually, a core part of his argument is that people are non-logical. Human mm. action is non-logical, right? In Pareto, but kind of an say, overlap with the, the Austrian school there as well, and 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 with Jonathan Haidt and Daniel Kahneman, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I.e., people are not rational, but Pareto's insight is that they think they are. Mm. They've got a. In fact, the way he explains it is, they've got a kind of uh, preference or a tendency towards wanting to believe that they're rational. Mm -hmm. And this is where the formulation of the BSBS therefore comes from. Because right, they, it's they, need, they need to generate yeah. an argument, a justification for what they've done, possibly even to convince themselves of why they've done mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. really, most of the time they're going on instincts, is what Pareto mm -hmm. is trying to say. But then, mm -hmm. being Pareto, he zooms out again and says... Well, actually, this aspect of human beings is constant, i.e. this is what people are like. So mm -hmm. given facts, even though they don't like to admit it, we can then make certain predictions about how power behaves, right? Um, so, like, I mean, one of the things they say <laughs> is that um, regardless of what your motives are of getting into power, once you get a taste of power, People don't like to get out of power again. They want to try to maintain and hold on to it. Um, and that tends to be the case. Um, I mean, the example I would always point to is when Mrs. Thatcher was ousted from power. You know, she was literally backstabbed by her own party. She went and cried for days. Or look at Tony Blair. Why doesn't he bugger off? He's got all the money he wants. He's been the prime minister. Why mm. didn't he just bugger off and leave it, leave us all alone. But no, he mm. spends every waking moment <clears throat> accruing more and more power to himself. Um, mm. so, so it is not... He, you, what you want to understand with elite theory, though, they're not talking about you or me mm. or any of the people yeah. in the chat. They're just the passive mass. They're just the crowd. They're talking yeah. about the behavior of people who get into these positions of power. And once they're in power... How do they behave? So, mm. I mean, there is a, there is a there is a bit of psychology in there, um, but um, how can I put it? Um, so, even though each individual is not rational, power itself has a kind of logic. Mm -hmm. It wants to centralize. It wants to eliminate rival castles. Can't stand. Um, things that are outside of its control um you know it will make moves to make sure that upstarts don't get in things like that mm -hmm. so and a person who doesn't naturally behave this way is unlikely to end up in the position of power in the first place and is if they somehow fluke into it is likely to also be removed much sooner there's almost a yeah, an evolutionary be, argument about they'll be this. select power will select for people who accord with the logic of power, if that makes any sense. I explained yeah. a lot of this in my re in, in my reply to Keith Woods. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I think it accords with what these people are like in power. But, uh, you know, people are free to disagree. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's carry on. Let's get us to Vietnam. <laughs>
By now, the systems and numbers approach dominated the Pentagon. McNamara's whiz kids were convinced that the battle against the Viet Cong could be managed in a rational, scientific way. Indeed, they could see no other way. The problem with the Vietnam War was that it, it was not a war for territory. What American policymakers needed, what the Pentagon needed, was some way of how do you tell if we're winning or not? Um, in the absence of being able to take Hanoi or something like that, they had to find other indicators. And what came out of that was, was a whole array of statistics. It ranged from the body count down to number of missions flown, number tonnage of bombs dropped, number of enemy structures destroyed, tonnage of food captured from the enemy. This is a chart that was used by uh, one of the think tanks to demonstrate how to uh, neutralize uh, an enemy village. Showing a flow that looks a lot of like how a... action can be taken. I, di I feel like there was a diagram like that from the previous episode as well. The, yeah, kind the of... Flo the flow chart. The flow chart. I, you do wonder if this kind of thinking plays into the forever wars, you know. Why were we mm. in Afghanistan for how long, how long was it? Twenty years. Yeah, so. I, I, I feel like they. I feel like the leaders from about the end of the Cold. Well, from about the mid nineties, uh, Blair and Bush, uh, Blair and Clinton onwards. I feel like we entered into a new paradigm, where all of these old systems and ways of measuring things, kind of. Um, when it came to foreign policy, kind of went out the window, and we were in some weird new paradigm that we still don't fully understand. Because um, mm. some of their motives are often mysterious when it comes to what they were doing, and um, even now it's hard to make sense of like Afghanistan, for example. I mean, still nobody right. really understands that, you know, or um, why did they that... why did they destroy Libya? You know, I don't know. Yeah. You need. <laughs> You need somewhere to um, cycle out your old stock of weapons so that uh, <laughs> so you can yeah, manufacture be, some more. Could be that, yeah. But if you're a if you're a top brass in the military, you want clear objectives, don't you? Take this city, mm -hmm. I, and I also think ethically, like if you're going to conduct a war, you ought to do so as quickly as possible. You should. Achieve your objective within as short a literal time span as you can, um, in order to minimise the needless human suffering that otherwise, you know, a long drawn out war. So, all, all of these, uh, all all of these kind of objectives about numbers of dead or you know, all the all the stuff he was just talking about is. It's just a hopeless kind of objective to give someone, you, you know, when, when the military rolls in, they're they're like, they should be like a bullet towards their target, not so, some gradual incremental process that goes over. You know, you can't manage a military in a managerial way. Is what I'm saying. Thinking in a very old-fashioned way, Luke. Those are the, that's remember what you said at the start. The old, the old ways don't apply anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but then something strange happened. <laughs> a new and powerful visionary idea. It was to a myth, neutralize an uh, enemy force. So, uh, is this village loyal to the belligerent? Consider the next village. Is this village loyal to the opponent? No. Based on reliable information, what does this village perceive? Do you think Genghis Khan had one of these? <laughs> <laughs> His flow chart was: Is she pretty? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> is this village loyal? No, burn. <laughs> <laughs> if 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 it is loyal, here's your dice. Steve <laughs> as its major problem. It's almost like a game of Monopoly, isn't it? <laughs> to the, Mr. McNamara and his brain trust of whiz kids, this was probably equal to the US Constitution. Do, do you know what it reminds me of? All right. Go on. <clears throat> I remember, I mean, as everybody knows, I worked in McDonald's for four years, Luke, and I won that McDonald's Ooh. scholarship, and I was a five, I was a five star member of staff. I had, <laughs> I had all my badges. A five star McDonald's general. 
my five star McDonald's minion. I was, um, wow. uh, you know, made it to Mac dress and everything. One of the things that fascinated me and kind of, I kind of simultaneously admired its kind of mundane evil, <laughs> but also kind of thought this is like really dehumanizing. Yeah. But also because I'm dark, kind of loved that dehumanizingness as well. I actually yeah. loved being part of the machine when I worked at right. McDonald's. <laughs> um, but um, they had a process for everything. There was a flow chart mm. for everything. And what, one of the things I always remember is that there was a flow chart for washing your hands. And it was literally like, number one, turn on the tap. Number two, wow, put your hands under the... Number three, press the soap. Number four, everything was a, was a flow chart process exactly wow. like this. And I find it really interesting that here we can see the U.S. military literally using McDonald's style flow, like Ray Kroc style, you know, systems process in the U.S. military. It's amazing, really. I mean, th <laughs> this is an algorithm. Like when you see a flow chart, that's like computer <laughs> code. And in a sense is also a, a form of artificial intelligence, right? This is the most reduced form of intelligence that somebody has thought about in advance what do they want to achieve how do they want to do it can we boil that down to the most straightforward steps um but yes this this is i kind of i kind of feel there is a a theme throughout the show of um people making decisions versus uh systems making decisions and mm -hmm. the, the, the people curtis is arguing against want to set up systems and they they really believe that if i mean they, he just mentioned the constitution this is another example oh. of a utopian system that people thought was going to run the world better than a ruler and i would argue there is no replacing the person at the top and the, the mm -hmm. way to make rule <clears throat> better is to have a good person at the top oh, oh. What one of the things I always remember from my McDonald's days to go back to that <laughs> was in the manager's office, the actual franchise owner who was also the the top manager there. He had a sign on the on his office wall, and it just said, "This is not Burger King. You don't get it your way." That was his sign. <laughs> I, 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 what what yes. I liked about what I liked about that is that yes, there were all these processes. But that manager had imposed his own Schmittian exception, i.e., <laughs> he can intervene at any time, and and his decision yeah. is final, basically. So yes. there, there, there you, was that human kind of executive element there. <laughs> you, you can tell who rules because of the way they wash their hands. <laughs> <laughs> it was the ultimate document. If one thinks of a political and military aggression. I will tell you, for example, that we long... So I don't want to do this into McDonald's, but if you've got time to lean, you got time to clean. That was one of the things that... <laughs> ...stations that we used to have on Vietnam, when McNamara would uh, be urging a, a certain measure, and uh, the president would say, well, Bob, what do you think the chances of success are? Oh, he would say, I think it's 55% and 45% failure. And I would speak up and say, Bob, are you sure it isn't 47% and, and 42%? <laughs> you know, I mean, this was, this was a, a frame of mind. And I like this guy. Nothing was ever expressed except in quantitative terms as far as McNamara was concerned, and he spoke for the whole Defense Department. Let me give you an example of, of the way the numbers worked. I, I love the idea that this Ben Stiller motherfucker was just in the middle of like <laughs> you've got all these old guys and like uh, hey dude you know I'm also here <laughs> yeah but do you think they looked around the room and was like S I've got a feeling somebody in here might be a Russian asset <laughs> is it the guy with the giant moustache and the, the wig <laughs> I happened to be on a patrol in uh, late spring early summer of 1967 where we spotted, observed a uh, Vietnamese national some hundreds of meters away from us, running away from us. And standard procedure at that time was to, you could fire on anybody running away from you. When
when we got to the body, we discovered that it was an unarmed older woman, 55, 60 years old. And in the intelligence summary that I prepared the next day, I put in exactly what happened. Um, by the time that that report reached the division level... I refuse to believe this guy is real. That is Dustin Hoffman in a disguise <laughs> as not a real guy. <laughs> Is this another scene that they that they prepared a script and got some actors in? Like, it's absolutely in the, ridiculous. They, they just took down the ladder for the the women that they shot. I, I mean, is <laughs> the this the, scene. is this the generational difference? Like, this guy's a boomer, and all those other all those older dudes Ooh, are like great greatest generation or whatever. And it's just like here is the bio letter. It's just like what the fuck is this? <laughs> that dead woman had become. Uh, an ageless, genderless Viet Cong with a Chinese communist grenade. And these, these numbers, these reports, these statistics directly obscured the reality and presented a picture that was 180 degrees removed from reality. And yet when we you always take hear all those numbers this, and dump them in the Pentagon... Uh, Soviet those... factories who were um, cooking the books, right, that they'd that they'd make up numbers to say they were more productive than they were. Mm -hmm. They'd produce, what was it, like chandeliers that would fall down from the ceiling. Yes. Everything. And this, this is interesting because it's those same stories that we were always told about how dysfunctional the Soviet system was, but about the US military. Yeah. And I, I think this will, this is a persistent theme in Curtis is the, the illusions that are created with statistics. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I do think that he does in one of his, in the trap, I think, he talks about the managerialism of Blair and Brown mm -hmm. and how everything in New Labour World was managerial and needed to be reduced down to quantifiable numbers. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, if you remember one of my early video now, probably six, seven years old at this point, how Tony Blair cooked the books with the crime stats. Mm -hmm. you know, he was able to show a graph with the crime going down when obviously the country had become more violent, but he could show a graph where it was doing the opposite. And mm -hmm. the numbers become, the story you can tell with the stats becomes more important than the lived reality. This is kind of what Curtis is getting at with the, the Vietnam stuff. <clears throat> Guys sit there and they count up the numbers and they can go, <laughs> we're winning. In 1967, Robert McNamara resigned in failure. Before he went, he made a speech in Montreal. He ended it by asking, Who is man? Is he a rational animal? If he is, then the goals can be achieved. But if he isn't, then there is little point in making the effort. McNamara had been the patron of the strategists. Without him, much of their power disappeared. They and their think tanks became targets for the mass protests against the war. I just want to say something a second. <clears throat> the image of Robert McNamara with his hair almost completely wet with brittle cream, right? Those, <laughs> those mm -hmm. thick rim glasses. The mm -hmm. kind of absolute image of cold, mundane, bureaucratic power. I kind of love that. <laughs> kind of like, it's like the banality of evil incarnate in one man, you know. I kind of love that kind of cold bureaucratic image that he's got. Um, and uh, I can only imagine the contempt he had for the hippies during this time. <clears throat> uh, Who were his, pol his polar opposite, in a way. <clears throat> yeah, I, I feel, though, that there is a certain... Uh... The, the the phrase the banality of evil kind of also encompasses that the hippies could could be incidentally a part of an evil system as well. Whereas mm. Mag Magnamara, I think, was quite deliberately leaning into things that he knew other people regarded as evil, right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of people They're back. protested. <laughs> the well, Samuel the Beckett play the driveway and continues. planted crosses in the front yard mm -hmm. of the institute. And it made, it made me and many of us here very angry because they were making assumptions about what we thought and they wouldn't even check. 
They thought we were warmongers up here. There's no question about that. They offered us jobs to go other places. As okay. we drove, when we would leave the driveway for lunch, they'd stop and offer us jobs if we'd leave Hudson Institute. None of us ever did. <laughs> Why is it for women? America's politicians had originally been attracted to the strategists because they promised a rational, controllable world. But in Vietnam, their methods had been used to create a fiction. The scientific approach had been... Such an out of courtesy <laughs> sentence there, Luke, to go back to your... Uh... Uh, could, yes, is that in my uh, <laughs> my bingo card somewhere? It, it, it had been used to create a fiction. <laughs> Corrupted <laughs> to preserve the politician's power. Of course, um, started, 2001 Space Odyssey business. Yes. came out in 68 is also kind of a commentary on this, right? The Yeah, and, uh, and, and I believe Dr. Strangelove, also by Kubrick, is based on that chap Khan that we saw earlier on. Huh. Interesting. Uh, I mean, yeah. interestingly, in Dr. Strangelove, he's a German, but and Dr. Khan is, uh, you know, but essentially the thinking in Dr. Strangelove was these dudes, these Rand dudes that were looking at in this. Yeah. <clears throat> All these many, many years ago, we stepped through a looking glass where people did the weirdest things, had the most perverse kind of logic imaginable, and yet claimed you know, to have the most precise understanding of everything and would give these perversely, superbly rational <laughs> You know, logical explanations as to why they were doing all of these perverse and irrational things. That was a world that's always existed. It's always been a perverse, irrational world. That was a world that these systems analysts stepped into. That's the mirror. They should have stayed on the right side. What they left behind was mad, mutual assured destruction, a giant system of nuclear defense with the two sides locked together, watching each other for the slightest move. But by the mid-70s, it seemed to have become an end in itself. We are part of the Aerospace Defense Command. We want to uh, maintain surveillance of all these satellites to uh, continually know where they are and also to determine if a new satellite is up there. Why, does that, why is that information required? Well, you got me. <laughs> the system of deterrence had begun. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> what a clip. <laughs> I don't know, mate. I just work, I just work here. They don't tell me why I need to know. <laughs> just, just following orders. You see, one of the things that I'm thinking of watching this, though, is that, OK, right, this attempt to impose a rationality on an irrational world was misguided. But the uh, boomer and hippie embrace, embrace of the irrational has also been a fucking disaster. So <laughs> I wonder, mm. like, you know, I mean, it's, it's clear that this is presenting uh, 60s counterculture in some way as a rebellion against all this, right? Especially as a, mm. the Vietnam, but uh, you know, counter Vietnam was so important to that generation. But I mean, the the abandonment of rationality has been terrible as well. So I don't know. Did, does Adam Curtis see <laughs> the counter culture, the the hippies, as having actually succeeded and achieved things, or that this was just a kind of cultural reaction? Like this, this is what was happening in Washington, and this is how everybody else. This is, this is the kind of um, us versus them. Uh, like, a, the, do, do you see what I'm saying? That the mm -hmm. did, did the did the boomers who took charge embrace irrationality, or was that just the mm. the popular sentiment in in reaction against their leaders? 
Yeah, it's good. It's good. I mean, I certainly feel like our leaders have embraced irrationality now, whether they did or not then. But I, I certainly yeah. feel like we we're in a more emotionalist time now, where mm -hmm. almost almost nothing, everything is a kind of knee jerk. It's almost like nothing is thought out. It's kind of feminine. So, yeah. you know, I, it, it's uh, I don't know. I need to th I need to think about that because uh, there's there's a there's a clear shift after this time. Mm -hmm. um a movement away from all this sort of stuff but any, anyway let's, let's carry on. Yeah. well i was going to say is there a postmodern influence on our current leaders that they probably reject a lot of curtis's framing because he's putting up these meta narratives about this is what happened then this was the whole shift in culture or is it and and this is why it's good or bad or meaningful or is it I really detecting our leaders are almost almost a zoomerish sense of i'm just going to do it cuz cuz it's the vibes this is what we do yeah. we're america yeah it's hard to, it's hard to say um but it, this is a question i'm going to keep on asking as we go through curtis's mm -hmm. oeuvre cuz i'm sure he will come back to the boomers inevitably uh, in mm -hmm. in later in later films on <clears throat> is rational it now seemed a dangerous trap if either side decided to attack, it would mean the end of the world. Then a politician came to power who believed that this was just what the Soviets were about to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States of America, Ronald Reagan! In 1980, on the campaign trail, Reagan came face to face with the delicate balance of terror. He visited NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, to see what they did. And he went and they showed him all these magnificent warning systems. And then he said, after you get the first warning, what do you do? And they said, well, we follow these incoming missiles a little further and keep track of them better. Then he said, what do you do? And they said, well, we follow them further and keep track of them better. And he kept asking, and the answer he wanted to hear was, and finally we shoot them down. But they never got to that. Because in fact, there was no missile defense. We had missile warning but we had no missile defense. And he thought, like a lot of people thought, that that's kind of crazy. I mean, that's got to be fixed. We've really got to work on defense. If science can do all these wonderful things that it's done in the past, it surely can accomplish this if we will just unleash it. But this was an age of disillusion with science. And the people who came forward with the solution the president wanted were zealots. Scientists like the inventor of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, he had long dreamt of a defensive missile shield in space. A lobby group was formed that proposed such a defence could be assembled using the new space shuttle. It was led not by strategists, but by two science fiction writers. <laughs> we ended up in well, <laughs> actor as president, <laughs> two fiction writers. <laughs> this is the famous uh, Star Wars thing. I remember yeah. it being Lampoon when I was a kid. Yeah. Is the, the strategic defence on initiative. space and military technology. We had access to the president, and because we had that access, no, it, nobody refused an invitation to come to the meetings, what it amounted to. So we ended up with a bunch of four-star generals and captains of industry and the entire military-industrial complex of the United States in Larry Niven's living room. And in fact, Jim Ransom pointed out that one RPG through the, through the plate glass window of Larry's thing would have pretty well crippled the United States technologically for 20 years. He was probably right. And science fiction <laughs> writers, by the way, turned out to be very key to this process because they could write the documents that were understandable by the president. <laughs> <laughs> Turn, yes, turn to McNamara. Turn to McNamara. We're seeing decline fast in these <laughs> documentaries. <laughs> let's, get back to, let's get back to base McNamara. Come on. It, well, of course, in the current administration, children's writers are important for the same reason. <laughs> yeah, or uh, yes, or whoever works at old people's home or whatever. So <laughs> Biden gets his uh, yes his talks prepared by. Um, People who are I mean, used to, to writing under five Most literature. Biden speeches are literally like half remembered speeches from Neil Kinnock and <laughs> like long forgotten politicians of the past, anyway. So he plagiarizes like 90% of all his speeches. So. 
there's some quite good supercuts where you see the original speech and then you see the, the poor, poorly, you know, remembered version of it. Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. Let us turn to the very strengths in technology that spawned our great industrial base and that have given us the quality of life we enjoy today. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies? My fellow Americans, I ask for your prayers. Many of Reagan's cabinet, including his Secretary of State, had had no advance warning of this proposal. <laughs> As they watched in the White House that night, they quickly discovered this was not going to be a magic escape from the cycle of terror. I'm going to build Star Wars, guys. <laughs> this is so fucking mental. <laughs> Just another twist. During dinner, I happened to sit next to the then Secretary of State, George Shultz. But he said, is it possible to put a laser up in the sky with sufficient power to knock out a Russian ICBM? And I said, yes, it is possible. Well, he said, doesn't that really make a tremendous difference? I said, not necessarily. If I were the Russians, I would be thinking about carrying a mirror, and you shine your high-powered light at me that can destroy me, and you'll get it back in your face. <laughs> super advanced technology defeated by power off. Mirror. <laughs> You've activated my trap card. Oh, I'm just. I'm not thinking sure about, about this. I. I, mean, I, I just think of like a He-Man he cartoon, Luke, where <laughs> Skeletor like shoots his laser, and He-Man just gets his sword and bounces the beam. I mean, how many times have you seen that? Come on. <laughs> I somebody might know the answer to this in chat, but I, my understanding was that a lot of ballistics doesn't really need to detonate or explode like you just have the sheer amount of energy contained in that much mass moving that quickly in that direction so if you shine a laser on it and it kind of pre-explode it when it lands it's still going to do the same or or more de now it might be with nukes that the detonation is complicated so if you blow up the nuke in high orbit you just kind of like softly irradiate the planet instead of destroying your target but well then yeah this it's no good what you're saying this is an <laughs> offense versus defense battle that has always gone on for every offensive weapon there's a defense and then when there's a defense there's an offense that beats the defense and this goes on into infinity and this is just some more of the same from Merrill's to rockets this city built its fame it's known after reagan announced the laser was coming to Oro Grande. It was a Cold War all over again. They were moving it out here to intercept any big, small, or bombs that would come in to our properties. It became known as Star Wars. Dramatic tests of different high-powered lasers were shown on American television. Can I just ask, why is this cafe owner so key to the narrative? Like, why is she the go-to person? <laughs> For, to get like, the reaction on the crowd. <laughs> She's like the one normal member of the public in this documentary. So. She is the man on the omnibus. People in chat are telling me that nukes are indeed pretty much useless unless they are triggered in precisely the right way. So I guess, I guess that answers my question. But behind the scenes, Thanks, there were serious problems, especially with the grandiose promises of Edward Teller working at the Livermore Laboratory. A small number of x-ray laser tests done underground in Nevada, but these tests uh, were failures as weapons. There's no way could this thing have been made into a weapon for sp uh, use in space. In that sense, they were failures. Yet in spite of this, uh, Edward Teller wrote uh, glowing letters uh, to high government officials under President Reagan. This x-ray laser is a remarkable invention. And I am not allowed to do to tell you more. I wish I could, would be allowed, and I think I should be allowed to tell you more, because the Soviets know about it anyway, in detail. Teller wrote, for instance, a single X-ray laser module 
the size of an executive desk, which applied this technology, could potentially shoot down the entire Soviet land-based missile force if it were to be launched into the module's field of view. Now, this kind of statement... If you're wondering, by the way, yes, Teller was as well. He has something in common with a lot of the other guys we've, from the RAND Corporation that we were looking at earlier on. <clears throat> is absolute blithering nonsense. It is science fiction. It's fantasy. It's, I also think it's dishonest. It was a corruption of science technology to promote a fantastic idea that could not ever work. But to those who had first persuaded the president, such problems were irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, blow him away. Just kill him, yeah! As it became apparent that the Soviet Union was close to collapse, they claimed that all along the idea had really been to bankrupt the evil empire. I love these little machines. Got him! Son of a gun! It worked! Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we were... So, <clears throat> can I get this right? A science fiction <laughs> plot was used to defeat the Soviet Union. Is, is, this, is this what I'm getting here? That Like a basically fictional weapon that didn't work and was never going to work was used. It sounds like it. I, I can't verify if Curtis I, is I find correct. it completely mind-boggling. But it does make you wonder if they lied about that. What else did they lie about? But anyway. <laughs> but did, did, this, did the Soviets buy it, though? Or, or was this... Was this not targeted at the Soviets? In fact, it was. Yeah, they wanted the they wanted the Soviets to bank. You just said they wanted the Soviets to bankrupt themselves. <clears throat> Putting together, did... uh, we, we we used all the rational analysis we could to put together a strategy to bring down the evil empire, and we did it. It happened. Five, four, three, two, one. It literally took. A set of scientific concepts, turned them into a policy, got it adopted, and used it to bring about, in my judgment, one of the key events of the 20th century. I mean, this is if this is true, this is pure postmodernism, Luke. This is just like the, yeah. not even science, just a narrative. But this is, is this... self-aggrandizement, potentially, right? These are the, yeah. the people putting themselves into history. Yeah, claiming that, claiming that they won the Cold War. Three. Essentially claiming that yes, they they single handedly defeated the yes, the second world. <laughs> Science did that. They brought down the evil empire. Challenger now heading down range. There were many reasons why the Soviet Union finally collapsed, but few people would count Star Wars among them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. For 40 years, the world had... <laughs> and it failed. Was... <laughs> yeah, but is that Curtis saying that few people recognise the reality that Star Wars was important? Or is he saying that these no, guys I, I, th are... I think I it? think he's saying that Star Wars just, <laughs> was just bollocks, basically. Was, was irrelevant, right? And, and it didn't. It was not a fact, though, in the, bringing down yeah. the Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah. ...been frozen by the two superpowers locked in conflict. The men from Rand had seen this as a system simple enough to control with this the This was the shot science. from the beginning of the documentary. Can I just say how mental it is, by the way, that those two lunatics just there <laughs> who were scientists literally had the entire US military in their office, sold this idea to the president, <laughs> and the president presented it to the State Department. What a fucking shit show. I can't believe that happened. Can you imagine <laughs> be, being on. in that cabinet and the the person in charge is an is mostly known for being an actor and the people running the <laughs> <laughs> running the tech that's supposed to take out the Soviet Union made their names writing fiction. <laughs> Insane. It's amazing. <laughs> When America's adversary crumbled, that simple world was replaced by complexity and chaos, far beyond the reach of their abstract theories. We 
we here at RAND believe that the last 40 years, the period from the end of World War II until 1989, was really a very unique period in history. Most of the history of Europe or of the world has involved uh, shifting balances of power and constant warfare, whereas the last 40 years, the balance of power was fairly rigidly frozen. And now we're seeing the balance of power is going to now become more complex the way it was before in the 18th century and 17th century. Is that true that the balance of power didn't change between 48 and 89? Well, it was in a kind of stasis between the two superpowers. And now, now the USSR is no longer on the map. You re-enter complex world. Is what he's saying because the mm. stability of mad and the whole doctrine that we've been watching was no longer there um <clears throat> and in fact you can see this with the uh discussions that are going on with nato <coughs> with nato at the moment you know they're currently discussing you know uh sweden and finland just join nato right mm -hmm. but there's a question that people ask a lot which is well what is nato for NATO's entire raison d'etre was to protect the world against Soviet communism. Soviet Union hasn't existed since the, since 1989. Well, it's in 1991, right? So, <clears throat> yet yeah, NATO still exists, and it doesn't have a defined purpose. It doesn't have a Would, mission. Yeah, is its mission uh -huh. to kind of defeat communism that that if you if, if you if you look at what nato was meant to be nato was meant to be a common defense uh against the warsaw the warsaw pact nations <clears throat> that was what it was it was it was a pure creature of the cold war so what should have happened is that after the ussr fell nato should have been disbanded because its mission was accomplished but NATO mm. was not NATO was not disbanded, but yet NATO doesn't have a clear objective, and and new proxy objectives have been have crept in, like spreading liberal democracy around the world, or defeating yeah. defeating Putla, or the war on terror, or whatever other bullshit they've come up with. The axis but of the, evil. But the fact is, is that the they're dealing in a complicated and complex environment with lots and lots of moving parts. And <clears throat> I would say uh, a critique I would, I would have of our leaders and of NATO is their attempt to impose a dualistic morality onto all their conflicts, right? Mm. Which is really quite stupid. Um, and their inability then to really understand what's happening anywhere. Like if you if you have a look at the Middle East, for example, the Middle East is incredibly complex. Okay, oh, we're there to fight the Arabs, or we're you know we're against the Iran, or those damn Muslims, or whatever. But there are there are there are literally hundreds of different militias with different agendas, uh, different states with different histories and different ethnic makeups, um, <clears throat> and yet the system can't deal with that so they simplify it down to we're just fighting bad guys over there somewhere right mm -hmm. um but it doesn't really work because you're you're actually dealing with genuine complexity would be the argument um and we don't i mean biden said the adults are back in the room but that's not how they behave and because of this mm -hmm. simplistic dualistic thinking that they have they create a mess everywhere they go um you know, the, I, I made a video a few weeks back on the <coughs> developing relationship between Iran, China, and Russia. Um, <coughs> they understand all of these realities on the ground. And I'm sure there are people in London and in Washington and in MI5, in MI6 and CIA and so on who do understand these things. But from all of the heads that I hear, the powers that be don't want to hear that. They just want to hear how how do we win, how do we defeat Putla, how do we like give the Iranians a bloody nose, 
where's the bad guy you know um mm -hmm. and and this is not a very good response to the uh to the challenges they're facing at the minute i, I would say mm. but uh, anyway <clears throat> to get back to the question of whether it's a unique time in history to have had a, a superpower not at war with its nearest rival was there not like 200 years where the roman empire was basically just stable and at peace i don't i don't know that it is so unique yeah, but there it... was no there was no hegemonic rival to the romans in the same way you could argue that the um the parthians which was the power in the in the persian you could argue that they were a kind of counterbalance somewhere in the world it wasn't really the same though it wasn't really okay. a kind of um a kind of entente situation where you had you know yes it was the cold war yes there was tension but there was never it never escalated into a full blown war and that created this equilibrium um <clears throat> and uh I mean, well, you can have a look at history since the fall of the USSR. It's been really messy. There's been lots mm. of pointless wars that the U America has been involved in. And it's, I mean, still people struggle to figure out what the purpose is. Um, mm -hmm. e even, even now what they're doing in Israel. I mean, I understand, you know, some aspect of Netanyahu's thinking and backing him and so on. But I still feel that they haven't really thought through what's what's actually going on there. I mean, it's mm -hmm. an uns it's it's actually an unsustain it's a historically unsustainable situation. What they're just gonna they're just gonna wipe out all the Gazans, and the rest of those powers around there are just gonna be okay with it forever, are they? That's not that's just not gonna be the case. They'll find a way of getting back at some point, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's in twenty years or fifty years or whatever or two years even. Um, and and the, the the worry I have is that the people who are meant to be the adults in the room aren't thinking like that. They're just thinking in these really simple narratives of like everybody's Hitler, basically. All our enemies are Hitler all the time. Um, and you you can't really deal with the world in that way. So, I it, I think it, <clears throat> leaders have always portrayed the world to their subjects in that way, though. I I suspect that even if it was you are called up to fight against the next, you know, you, you're being conscripted for the next few years to go on a little parochial war. Yeah. But you don't view the, you don't view the people who've been living fifty miles away from you for your entire life as basically your brother. That you think you've been inculcated to believe mm -hmm. that they are the, you know, the the worst scum. The way of life is disgusting. Their way of waging war is unpalatable. I, I, I think this kind of propaganda is as old as time. Yeah, but... So, so it, the but, question but, is, do the leaders really buy it, I guess? I mean, I, I just I just look at their action, the things they say right. and their actual actions, yeah. and their actual actions over Russia mm. and the Ukraine situation suggest mm. that they do at some level. Mm. Mm. you know they're not act they're not actually acting in a rational way mm. um and it, in fact their actions are increasingly erratic i would say i mean just yeah. last week M macron saying oh if uh if putin <laughs> if putin goes to odessa and kiev france is going to declare war on russia i mean this is a complete mad thing to say it's completely outside of the the realms of reality France does not even have the army to, f to fight a war like that. And yet he said it anyway, and he's the president of France, and the entire world saw it. Was it rational for Britain to get involved in the world wars? No. And, and if, so in fact, it's older this than. Is, <clears throat> this is, a, but you see, in, in my conception, World War II, you could argue it's World the War I. As well, but yeah. but it, the belligerence of Churchill. And the the kind of we must defeat Hitler at all costs, at all costs, you know, even if it means mm. torching the entire em empire, we must defeat him, we'll never mm. surrender, you know, that that whole mindset is we still like in the background. Yeah. 
it, it's still in the background of every conflict we fight. So we're just like refighting World War II all the time. Um, only not, only not, because the the Americans are so childish that they don't even see it through. I so so in like in the Ukraine situation, we're going to back you to the hilt. Uh, you know, pumping Zelensky up. Uh, you know, you can beat them. You know, giving the Ukrainians assurances, you can win this. Now we're two years in. Oh, they're fed up. Oh, they lost. They lost interest. <laughs> they, they, the Republicans don't want to fund them anymore. You know, you're on your own now. Sorry, bud. Um, and no. you see, it's it's that combination of having the belligerence of the Churchill, and no. then not actually following through either, which is just like, well, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. You can you can explain some of it by politicians making decisions in the short term because of they only care about their term limits you know, up t up till the next election. Um, so they're making l literally they they have no, not the slightest care about the long term future of the country. They just want whatever will whatever will make them most likely to get elected next time. Maybe. Let's, <coughs> let's, get, let's get to the end of this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Suddenly the Soviet Empire collapsed. What had kept me going through all these many, many years of professional activity disappeared. There was no enemy. We've returned to what we never left. Human normalcy. And we're going to be in for more surprises. I don't know what. We're going to be in for more wars. Of what kind? Of what magnitude? I don't know. The strategists were part of an age that believed political problems could be solved by the application of knowledge. Their success in preventing Armageddon seemed proof that it worked. But they were lucky enough to inhabit a world that was simple, frozen by the deadlock between the superpowers. That odd moment in history is over, and with it has gone the optimistic faith that the world was being changed for the better. We are about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. Stand by. Very interesting, uh, very interesting thesis uh, uh, Curtis put forward here. Um, I, I, I would also uh, <coughs> say, Luke, as a some <coughs> final thoughts here. <coughs> I mean, I, I enjoyed that one. I thought it was good. I th and I, mm. I liked the way it fit together in all sorts of interesting ways with the, with the, with the previous one. Um, but thinking in terms of what our leaders are up to now and how they've diverged from this um in a strange way at the end there there was almost like a sadness that the ussr had gone it's like america's raison d'etre had left it um i read a really interesting article the other bit day by a guy called joseph jordan who's got a great substack that i i read sometimes mm -hmm. and he he wrote a piece called the decline of the american empire in two parts uh, part one was looking at demographics uh, part two was looking at the economy, right? And he argues in that essay that the Cold War and the existence of the USSR and the fact that the USSR collapsed actually helped America mask a lot of its structural problems. Mm -hmm. It actually made things seem better than they were. But there were all sorts of issues, underlying problems in the American economy that had never been solved, that are actually now coming home to roost. It's all like kind of unraveling before us. And that um, the fall of the USSR kind of gave a little kind of artificial bump, which you could see as the Blair Clinton, George Bush era, right? Mm -hmm. But basically that all came to an end in 2008, and the empire has been on absolute fume since then. Uh, and he even argues that really since 1971, it kind of has been on fumes and that all of this stuff that we were looking at helped to 
paper over all of that. But now that mirage has gone as well. So it's just a very interesting thesis that is worth thinking about, uh, you know, in relation to all of this. <clears throat> it, it does feel like there are no vital countries in the world that um, if there was a if there was a truly uh, up and coming civilization, then you could measure America or any other current country against it. You know, I, I don't think that China is this super ascendant country. I, I'm not convinced that Russia has it to become the new superpower themselves. Yeah. Like if, everything's just this kind of dilapidated group of has-beens who are just leaning against one another. So yeah, I, I, I kind of kind of agree that in a way, after the Soviet Union collapsed, America no longer had a measuring stick to to kind of propagandize <coughs> with. We're like whether it's true or not that, that America, yeah. as the land of the free, the home of the brave, w w they only had to be freer and braver than their arch nemesis and they only had to achieve that by their own by their own propaganda and measurement um, yeah i mean i i do think that america's authority is undermined um now um partly owing to the disaster of <coughs> how the ukraine thing has gone you know mm -hmm. they they promised that russia would be sunk by their sanctions and they promised that ukraine would win yeah. Russia did not get sunk by the sanctions and yeah. Russia looks like it's going to win that war. Okay. Mm -hmm. On top of that, China, now I understand all the arguments that China is not the be all and end all and it's got its own problems on, and so on. But in terms of being an actor to deal with, a big power to deal with in the world, okay, for other countries, I mean, <clears throat> mm -hmm. when China says it's going to do something, it, one, it will do it. And it means it. So if you make a deal with the Chinese, they don't Welsh on the deal. And more importantly, the Chinese don't come in and tell you how to run your bedroom. They don't come in and tell you you have to hire women or black people or any of this bullshit, right? And I and, mm -hmm. and America and the West more widely, Britain is like this as well, unfortunately, um, has become an absolute pain in the ass to deal with. For any other nation, because they, they give very much hall monitor energy, don't they? Yeah. So, I mean, for example, right, we talk about Tony Blair and the good work that the quote unquote charity work he does around Africa, right, with Bill Gates and all his other mates. The trouble is, is that when you get that, if you're an African nation and you're getting this help from Blair, it comes with all sorts of bullshit attached. Oh, we're going to build you a lovely state-of-the-art university here with all the all infrastructure and all the computing and internet connection and all the mod cons. We're going to bring you up to the fourth industrial revolution, right? But African, you have to educate women. You have to institute feminism. What you're doing, however, if but, you have your uh, bridge you know, built by China, then you're going to be in kind of financial servitude to them. And yeah, they'll probably but it's still, them. it's still like less of a pain in the ass because you okay, right. I'm in debt to China. If I don't pay them back, here are the terms and conditions. We'll take your land. Okay. Yeah. Now, now that could be like a debt trap, whatever, but it's still pretty straightforward to deal with mm. them. It's not straightforward to deal with the West. It comes with a whole bunch of bullshit. And I think increasingly, as that continues to be the case, uh, a lot of nations are not going to want to put up with it if there's an yeah. alternative. If there's an and alternative, as, you, and, yeah. as you've observed, the British were were much less about cultural erosion than the U.S. Empire has been. So, the the cost to you being in debt might be that you lose your possessions, but the the cost of doing business with the U.S is that they will force you to become like them in a, in every way. Yeah. Yes, which is, you know, potentially at the cost of everything, culture, mm. history, your demographics, everything.
So it's, it's like a mafia yeah. deal, like you're part of the family now, and the family behaves in a certain way. Exactly. And I, I think that a lot of the nations outside of what we call the West are going to look at those two deals on offer. And unless, I mean, Trump could come in and change everything, right? Uh, but uh, unless uh, the West changes its approach and its attitude, it's just going to be like, well, one, f fuck off, because the Chinese are giving us a better offer. And two, actually, why are you telling us what to do? Mm. Well, what gives you the right to tell us what to do? Especially because you sat back and watched Israel bomb the fuck out of the Gazans for the last few months. Don't Don't tell us about bum sex. You know, where's your morality there? So, I mean, I, I, re I really do think that um, uh, that is going to be a problem in the next 10 years <laughs> going forward for uh, what we call the West. And we, we could be entering a period where um, we have less power that collectively as the West and America has less power than it did. But that might not be a bad thing for all of us, you know, might actually be a good thing. Mm. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> there are some super chats if you've got some time, Luke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, Lil, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> my cough has come back. Do you want me to read them? <clears throat> uh, can you see them? Well, I can only see the ones that come up here in uh, StreamYard, which I think is the YouTube comments only. Uh, if, if you, uh, if you, I'll put it in the private chat. Okay. There, there are the entry links, if you can see them. Let's have a look. <coughs> it's just loading. Uh we I can't go... see any. It's, bl it's blank. Oh, it's blank. Okay, I'll, I'll read them. Don't worry. <coughs> um, Lil Arota says, intro would be better if it finished with the line, bit great today, in it, in the normal voice. Cairo, I don't think God is going to remix it again. <laughs> uh, Cairo Skuro <laughs> says, uh, I have heard Putin st stated that nuclear retaliation would involve detonating nukes in space in order to knock out satellites and electronics to take us back to 1993 and Fresh Prince. Uh, Matt Diff says, three-body problem is part of a sci-fi book out of China. Earth gets in metal assured distraction situation with an alien and it holds. Eventually a woman is put in charge of it and the aliens attack, figuring she won't push the button. They were right. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Spasticus Autisticus says, Dr. Strangelove, yes. The whole point of the doomsday machine is lost if you keep it secret. Why didn't you tell the world, huh? De Sardinsky, <coughs> Sardinsk it was announced at the party congress on Monday. As you know, the Premier loves surprises. Surely game theoretical reasons making the use of nukes irrational persist even after the first nuke goes off. After a first strike, retaliating is irrational for precisely the same reasons as first strikes seem irrational now. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I guess the theory is that you have to launch your nukes before they've even landed on you. Um, and you have to have processes in place that make that inevitable. It's like, um, it's like you set up a machine, so you no longer have control over the machine, but you tell your opponent that the machine is in place, and therefore even though you're right that the machine operating is not in your interests, but nonetheless you've set it up in a way that means that it happens whether you like it or not. So the, it's like the logic of mutually assured destruction relies on the fact that you have set up a machine that will do irrational acts under certain circumstances. Um, yeah. Um, Ma Maxwell Bliss says, why do you not both like Churchill? <laughs> we actually ended up answering that, didn't we? Um, well, I mean, I would say the, lo the long answer is, if you go back and watch the, the first five episodes of this series, the Adam Curtis one, uh, the, o the Oceans Apart, and watch my comment, watch the Oceans Apart with my commentary, um, especially the second and the third episodes, that basically explains why I think Churchill is such a such a shithead. Basically, um, if you want an even longer answer, 
I read a book in its entirety called Britain's Blunder on Cigar Stream, but you'll have to join the channel to watch all of those. But uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want an even longer answer, you can watch the very long series, multi part series done by Thomas777 with uh, Pete Quinones over on his podcast. So, but you know, you, you could probably lose a week there listening to reasons why you should hate Churchill. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Anglo Eddie says, "Could an Elon Musk type figure become president?" I did worry for a while that Mark Zuckerberg might one day become president. I mean, it seems like with the increasingly kind of spectacle-based politics that it's it's name recognition. So yeah, I think I think so. I, I've I've never seen Elon indicate that he wanted to be president. So, in the case of Musk, I, in particular, I I don't think it'll happen. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, the question is why? Why would you want to become the president? You could arguably have more power and not become the president. Um, mm. Status. And, and another argument she could be. Donald Trump is literally a billionaire who became the president. So <laughs> he is already yes, he is an Elon Musk type figure. So clearly yes. PS says JFK cheated his way to the presidency with family and machine connections. Folks that admire him did downplay it as much as possible, but they don't really dispute it. This was true at the time and today. Yeah, I mean that's basically out in the open. I read um on the Scar Street, me and Charlemagne, I read through like a whole book. Uh, I didn't read the, uh, cover to cover, but I read key passages of this book, which basically outlines everything, and it's just out there. It's just an obscure academic book that was published in the 80s. And as far as I can tell, it's just acknowledged by everybody that that happened. The real, qu the real question is, is there anything in politics that that is really cheating? Like, th does everybody, quote-unquote, cheat to the point where that's just the that that's just the activity of being a politician yeah it's just war by a different name right so you get whatever edge you can i mean yeah. the republicans literally gerrymander seats this is just well known practice they redraw the districts to make sure that it's full of re republicans or white people which is code for republicans in america <laughs> <laughs> um uh uh, P.S. says, uh, sorry, the Henry Ebb says, have you watched the McNamara documentary Fog of War, 11 Lessons from the Life of Robert McNamara? No, I have not. I have not watched that. I did watch the 11-part Vietnam documentary that came out a couple of years back, which heavily featured McNamara as well. Um, you know, there's a... I have a bit of a different take on Vietnam from a lot of people which is that there's a reason why that is the one war <laughs> that it's all right to be against. Hmm. And that is because a certain faction within U.S. political power was not really up for that war in the same way that they've been up for certain other wars. Is, so is that just because they're indifferent to that war or they actively oppose um, it? It was to do with the it was to do with the geopolitics of uh, where Israel positioned themselves back in back in the mid sixties. Mm -hmm. uh, all that changed in nineteen sixty seven, I want to say, and really a lot of the big figures. If you have a look later on down the line, who came into power were against the Vietnam War. So that's the one war it's all right to be against. One, because the boomers remember it fond fondly, but also it was kind of the last war fought by the old elites before the before the big change that happened in the mid sixties. There, so <clears throat> oh, um, interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying that I I think Vietnam was a great war and it was justified or anything. I'm just saying that there's probably a reason why McNamara is vilified as much as he is, but you don't get kind of feature like do documentaries on, um, you know, 
some of the shitheads who did uh, the Iraq war who were in Bush's mm. cabinet. And if you do, it will be Dick Cheney who gets a lot of the flack uh -huh. because he was the one Gentile in that cabinet. Hmm. The, th the, the only things uh -oh. that come to mind with the Vietnam War for me are napalm and hearts and minds. They didn't win the hearts and minds. So if that's mm -hmm. a, a measure for like the the way it is presented in UK schools, you know, 15 years ago. <laughs> the Henry Up says, oh, sorry, Sam153 says, liking the AA Lambda dynamic. Did anyone get a bingo? <laughs> that's a bingo. I didn't get a f I didn't get a full line, but yeah. yes, got a few quite a few squares crossed off here. Lady of Shalot says, I wonder if our current elites ever watched the nineteen eighty four film Threads about a nuclear attack on Sheffield. We watched it at school and it terrified us. Uh yeah, I was a bit young to experience the full like, kind of nuclear there's gonna be a nuclear war, get get in the bunker type stuff. It's just a little bit before my time. I was two in nineteen eighty four, so um, it, do, do you have a feeling for what that was trying to achieve? Was it was it genuine? Did they actually want to save people's lives because they thought nuclear war was was it actually possible, or did they have a different? Was it part of uh, building up the Soviets as as villains? I, don't know. I mean, I, I think fear. Uh, if you have a look at the title of this stream, uh, fear is a good kind of control mechanism. But yeah. I do actually think some part of it was genuine as well, that they did genuinely mm. fear a nuclear war as well. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> our Lady of Charlotte says, I wonder if our current... Um, Webster says, Stone. Americans Americans, due to their geography are way too prone to self-arrogance and shielded by the isolating 2C geography when it comes to, uh, to foreign geopolitics and history. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that um, there's always this impression, and we saw this in Oceans Apart vis-a-vis uh, -vis World War Two, that it's happening over there. And as long mm. as it's happening over there, it's not really real. And they don't really have to care about it. All of that changes as soon as one soldier is killed. And then it's mm. Oh, we have to bring the boys back home. We have to bring the boys back home. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, so that's true. I, I mean, I, I I I genuinely feel that the American leadership in the past forty years, pretty much, has been much like a woman, kind of quick to anger, irrational, and then kind of changeable as well. So. They don't have a, you know, as soon as something change, like as soon as the situation changes, they'll change their mind. Much like mm. a woman who buys a dress, gets it home, tries it on, looks in the mirror, looks at it again, looks at it again, and then decides she wants to take it back to the shop. It fucking drives me crazy, Luke. It drives me crazy. But <laughs> um, the the yeah. other aspect of the American mentality that feels feminine to me is is the adoption of quote unquote children classes, the the protected groups for whom any kind of affront, no matter how slight, gets the reaction of a you know, a, a mother hen would kind of attack create like anybody even looks the wrong way at the brood and and you you know, you, you adopt these children that you have. This is not really foreign policy commentary, but uh yeah, it, it, you're right. There is another aspect of their thinking, without without doubt, yeah. um, <clears throat> and that is probably why a lot of uh, liberals are indeed women. I mean, the Democrats in America have become the party of women. You know. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Um, that's it. And that's it. So, Luke, tell us again, again about your new venture. Yeah, get, remember to. Go and find in the description. There's a link to the trailer, which is on a new channel. the 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 new channel will only have this play on it. I might also release the soundtrack, but uh, I, I what I what I'm instructing the viewers to do is subscribe to the new channel and click the bell button so that when the thing releases, you're notified for it. Um, and the the play is called Ascension. 
It's very exciting. I've got I've got lots of people involved, so you'll definitely know lots of the people, lots of the cast. Great, and uh, I will I will just tell everybody: do buy my courses, at the Academic Agency, especially the Trivium, Foundations of Economics, Foundations of Politics, and all the other courses. Um, and uh, Shakespeare one should be on the way. I can't promise a date yet, but I'm going to start working on it as soon as I'm better. You know, so if I don't die, I'll start it starts next week or something. Um, do you take care of yourself. <coughs> Yes, uh, well, thanks a lot. And I will see everybody next week uh, on uh, Cigar Stream. Uh, apart from Mellow mellow Moments viewers, where I'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Bye, everyone. Good night. What goes on in this town is none of your business. As long as I'm living here, it is. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here! Well, that's easily fixed.